Hello, this is PJ Clanton with Integra Coach, Technical Training Director. Today we're going to do a walkthrough delivery of the 2024 Aspire. So we'll start at the front door and at our keyless entry system. It's always, for, for one, important before you start working on the keyless entry that you always have an extra set of keys outside. Keep that key fob with you and the keys as well. I'm going to go ahead and close the door and we're going to talk about the keyless entry system. The operation of this keyless entry system, to lock the doors, press and hold the one button. That locks the entry door and disables the cargo doors. To unlock them, we do use a default access code for all of our coaches. That access code is just simply one, two, three, four, four. And then press and release the one button. We'll unlock just the entry door. If we would do the one, two, three, four, four, that five digit access code and press and release the two, that will unlock the entry door and also enable the cargo door access. If we were to do the five digit access code and just press the three button, that would allow us to enable the access to the cargo doors, would not do anything with the entry door. So we wanna talk about setting up your own access code. You will want to set up your own access code because like I said, they are all default to the same access code. So it's just kind of a safety um, thing for you and security issue for you to have this set up to a default access code. So I'm going to take you through the steps of knowing how to set up your access code. The first thing you're going to want to know is the default authority code. So again, we do this by default. This is the same on everything. The default authority code is the number four, five times. So we just simply hit the number four or five times when it's requested. To get into the programming mode, to reset your access code, simply press and hold the three icon. It's gonna take about five to seven seconds. It's going to beep and then flash. You will need to enter your five digit authority code. So for us, that is the four five times. There's a long sustained beep saying that it has recognized that. Now you have the opportunity to select what channel. You can program up to four access codes. We're gonna go ahead and select number one. And just for uh, showing you how this works, I'm gonna go ahead and enter the default access. It will ask you to confirm with a double beep, so you enter your default access again. And there we have reprogrammed the access code to the keyless entry system. So just to test it out, press and hold the one, two, or sorry, just the one button. Now the five digit access code, our entry door has locked. Our cargo doors have disabled. Now we're going to access the coach. One, two, three, four, four. Press and release the two. That unlocks the entry door and gives us access to the cargo doors. Now that we have our cargo doors open, I'm just gonna set the keys down here we're going to continue on down the front of the coach here on the passenger side. In our first compartment door, first storage compartment here, you are going to find a remote control in this front corner here. That is for your Gerard awnings. Just grab this out of here real quick. This is going to be the remote control for the Gerard awnings. This is the patio awning. Simply press any button and it wakes it up. The way this is set up, is our different channels. Zero should run both awnings, the front and the rear. Channel one should run just the front awning and channel two should run just the rear awning. So you can choose both of those at the same time just by cha choosing channel zero, they will run in and out. Now this is also controlled by the Vega Touch inside and we'll talk about that a little bit later. So that is going to be in your front compartment here. We do set this up for an optional freezer if this had the freezer in it, you would have a freezer in this storage compartment here. It is a um, two separate sided freezer and it is operated by 12 volt. So we are not hooking that up to 110. It will not be on an inverted circuit in the basement. Freezer actually runs more efficiently on 12 volt. Um, so if that was the option in this particular floor plan, that would be in this compartment. So we'll go ahead and move back to the next one. The thing we want to see here is the auxiliary air input. The auxiliary air input is an air chuck that's located down in the basement here. That is going to be right here in between door one and two. 
and you'll see that just listed up in here. I'm going to go ahead and turn the cargo lights on so we can get a better picture of that. So inside you will find this air chuck mounted right here in between the two doors. That is essential um, for any, any time this coach would need to be towed. If that was an issue, we would have to have that air supply. The tow vehicle, um, just show them where it's at. They will know how to work this and what it's for. It's actually to keep the airbags aired up and also to keep the brakes released. Um, you can use it as well for small things, airing up bicycle tires, maybe some inflatable toys and stuff for the kids or the grandkids. So it can be used in that manner as well. The next thing we're going to talk about in this compartment is the cargo tray. So this is a manual cargo tray. You can have an option to get both cargo trays. Simple operation of the cargo tray on this particular one, pull up on the blue lever. This will pull out. Obviously, we can store many things on here as you're uh, filling up your coach and getting ready to hit the road. The one thing we want to make sure of is that we pay attention when it goes in and locks that it latches in place. The other thing that's very important to understand is the weight capacity. So this has a caution sticker right here. The weight capacity on this is 800 pounds and the key is that it's evenly distributed. So what we don't want to see is having a 500 pound tool chest on one side and maybe three or four lawn chairs on the other. That kind of gets that off balance. We put too much pressure on one side and that kind of wears out the bearings. It can also um, have an effect on the way this thing runs in and out. So we want to make sure that we have that evenly distributed. So we'll go ahead and close this up. Next thing we're going to talk about is the exterior TV and entertainment center. So on the exterior TV and entertainment center, the TV is on the swivel and tilt. So this does pull out. You have the ability to tilt it back and forth, swivel it back and forth as well. That is one of the primary reasons that there's only one strut on this door. Now that one strut is big enough to hold that up. And then let's talk about the radio. So the radio here and these two speakers are going to be the primary source of your sound coming from the TV. There are several different modes to the radio. This will do FM, this will do Bluetooth, and it will do the TV. And then it also has the dash radio wire to it. So the example for the dash radio, um, if you've got Sirius radio and you've got that tied to your dash radio, you can come outside and you can select this to the dash radio and have your Sirius radio outside with you instead of being inside. All right. Uh, the remote controls are labeled. You will have a remote control for the TV. It will have a label on the back of it that says exterior TV. So once you get all of those, you can go ahead and set that out here and it should be safe to have right here in this compartment. In this compartment here, we're going to open this up just so we can get in there and take a look at what's going on. I'm going to go ahead and shift to the next compartment here to show you some of the electrical components that are located in the basement. Some things that you will want to know and exactly where they are um, just to show you the fuses and breakers and different things of how that works. So I'm going to go ahead and open the next door. We'll get a shot here of the electrical components starting right here on the outside wall. So here we have our battery disconnects. This is actual battery disconnects where you can eliminate all of the parasitic draw to your house batteries. So the different um, sources that are on here, the leveling jacks have their own power supply. The house power, this is going to be what controls getting 12 volt power into the entire coach. The battery link is our battery boost connection, so that connects the house batteries to the engine batteries. So we can use that as a supplemental battery. And then our generator and front fender compartment, that's the power supply to the generator and that front driver's side fender that have several components in it as well. This device right here is our GoPower solar controller. So this is going to be on all the time. Anytime you have um, solar power present, that is going to be showing up. You'll have some indicator lights right here up at the top. And that is constantly connected to the battery. So there is no disconnect to that. Anytime there's solar energy being produced, your coach should be drawing that in and saving that and storing it in those batteries, keeping those batteries charged up. Let's go inside here a little bit and look at the disconnect that's on this next wall in. That is for the inverter. So that rotary knob is the inverter control. It provides the 12 volt power to the inverter. Um, anytime you would need to reset the inverter, that is where we're going to do that. And if we wanted to eliminate all parasitic draw, we would also want to be turning off that breaker as well. So there's a little instruction uh, labeled there underneath it as how that operates and how that is working for your coach. 
The other thing I want to show you is going to be just inside this carpeted panel. So we're going to go ahead and take this carpeted panel off and get a shot of the inside of that where it will show you the fuse panels and some small breakers and things we have as well as the solenoids for the 12 volt disconnect and for the battery merge. So let's take a look inside that compartment. All right, now that we've gotten the cover taken off this compartment, there is a label here that gives us all the description and the pinout for this device here. This is our Firefly M1 system. That's what's providing power to the inside lights and some of the component slide outs and things like that. The other things we want to talk about in here, the battery isolator manager, that's this guy here. That is what connects our house batteries to our chassis batteries. The battery disconnect is what's providing our 12 volt power to inside the coach. So anytime you go right inside the entry door, hit the main power switch, it's got the little red light next to it. That's what's controlling this, connecting our house batteries to the load on the inside of the coach. Two separate fuse panels here. One is going to be a constant circuit, so these are on all the time. And then this one here is going to be a battery disconnect circuit. So fuses are going to be behind these uh, clear plastic covers and they are labeled accordingly. The battery disconnect circuits means that if we have the battery disconnect off, these are going to be disabled. The constant battery is there going to be enabled until we turn off the battery disconnects. Series of small breakers here are going to be some comp components that we have in the basement, things like the mass rater and, and uh, some toilets and things that are all controlled here in the basement. So kind of gives you an overview of the electrical compartment in the basement. We want you to be aware that there are fuses down here that you may have to come and check from time to time. Now that we've seen the electrical compartment, let's go ahead and move back another bay in the coach. This is going to be our fresh water tank. Um, this is going to give you a gauge here where you can see how much water is physically in the fresh water tank and then our gravity fill. So the gravity fill for the fresh water tank is just direct. Put a hose in and you can fill the gravity, um, the fresh water tank from here through gravity fill. Note that when you do use the gravity fill, you are not filtering the water before it goes into the tank, so that may introduce some sediment into the tank. Not to worry, when we use the pump to pull that water out of the tank, we are putting that water through the filter, so it is being filtered. We should be able to remove some of that sediment if it is present in the tank. So that's our fresh water tank access. Let's go ahead and move back behind the wheels here. We will look at our next compartment back, which is going to be our def fill couple things about the def fill here. So this is the def tank here, should be about a 15 gallon tank. And they're gonna be, um, depending on your floor plan, you will have a driver side def fill as well. So we do a dual def fill depending on the floor plan it all determines, um, all depends on how we have the floor plan laid out and where the slide out lands on the back side. So this would be our def fill here. One thing we wanna make sure of is that we never let that run out. Um, we would have access to the gauge at the digital dash that will show us. It'll give you a yellow warning, then a red warning. If you ever get to the point that you have a red warning, it's most likely going to derate the engine. You are going to be limping on the side of the road to get to the next service station to put some def fluid in. So let's make sure that we don't allow that to get down below um, about a quarter of a tank. We really want to see that thing stay above a quarter of a tank all the time. The other thing that is in this compartment is just here behind the tank is a small lanyard. That's a pole lanyard. That is an air release or a moisture ejector for your safe haul brake tow system. Again, that's something we want to be maintaining and watching out for. Um, when we're driving the coach, it can build moisture in the air system. So we want to make sure that we eject that out and just pull that lanyard until you hear just constant air and there's no moisture coming out. The other thing is going to be the valid air leveling system mana block or mana fold. This is where we have Schrader valves where you can manually air up the airbags of the suspension of this coach. Again, this is a key thing that may come into play if you ever had to have this vehicle towed. A tow company could come in and manually air up each one of these bags um, to make sure that they stay at the right height. So that kind of sums up for our def fill here. Let's go ahead and go back to the next compartment, which is going to be our chassis battery um, disconnects and chassis batteries and fuse panels and things. We'll talk about these. So there are two uh, large breakers that you see here right off the bat. These two breakers, the top one here is for your engine. This is what we call the chassis disconnect. What this does is prevents the engine from starting. So if we turn this off, it would keep the starter from activating. Um, anytime you're working in the engine, checking fluids, maybe checking the oil or, or trying to put coolant in or anything like that, just maintaining that engine, you would want to have this in the off position so someone couldn't inadvertently start the engine while you're back there working in it. This bottom breaker here is for the battery merge. 
So that is where we connect the chassis batteries to the house batteries. That breaker is just protecting the chassis batteries from our solenoid. Anytime you're driving down the road, the alternator can automatically charge your house batteries. And anytime you're parked for a, let's say, two, three weeks, we can charge the chassis batteries off of our charger, our inverter, as we're plugged into shore power. The other thing we want to make mention inside is this fuse panel here. So this is just a rotary fuse panel. It does have a cover. It's about a quarter inch to turn this. Once you turn that and it releases, there is a label on the inside that will give you the fuse locations and there are some extra fuses and a fuse puller. So there's going to be several things back here, but most commonly in this fuse panel are your tow vehicle lights, or brake lights, turn signals, marker lights, that sort of thing. And it also has a fuse in there for your uh, brake controller. Um, so anytime we have an issue with a vehicle that we're towing, that's going to be where we look for the fuses to make sure that they are okay. These two breakers right here are also being supplied to us as the OEM for the body. This one here is going to be for our battery, uh, chassis battery sense wire. So that basically just gives us the chassis battery voltage to our Vega Touch system. On our Vega Touch screen inside, there's a chassis battery icon. That is where that voltage comes from. So if you ever see any dashes or zeros there, we would just want to come back and check that fuse. This next little breaker here is actually for our engine door. So we're kind of going to make this transition around to the engine compartment and that breaker is supplying power to our engine door switch. So to open the engine compartment, simply using this switch here, it's not a manual, it is automatic and powered. So go ahead and push the open and that is going to open the engine door at the back of the coach. So now that we have the engine hatch open, we want to just show you a few things that you'll want to be checking um, pretty much before every trip. Every time you take a, a trip or get this on the road, there are some pre-trip inspection things that you want to be looking at and verifying that we have all of our fluids are up to par, um, we're full, we don't have anything that's short, and pretty much that we just have everything clear of the engine before we start the engine. So we'll start right here. This is going to be our engine coolant. We want to make sure that this little eyeglass right here is full of fluid. It's going to be the final charge fluid. So we want to make sure that that is completely full before we get headed on the road. This is going to be your engine oil fill. So this is where we can add oil if needed. And then this is our engine oil dipstick. This is where you would check the engine oil level in the coach. Again, check it for here and then we would fill it here. Now this is going to be the transmission where we would use the transmission dipstick to check the level of that. Um, you can also use this as a fill tube, but there is an easier way to check the transmission fluid. We'll explain that a little bit later when we go inside and talk about the shifter pad, because there is a digital way to do that. That is a whole lot more accurate than using the dipstick. This right here in the center, a 110 junction box. This is for your engine block heater. Notice we do not plug this in. It's not really the greatest practice to have that plugged in all the time. The only time you really want to use this is if you are in sub-zero temperatures. And now we're saying sub-zero temperatures. If you know you're going to be starting off in the morning, and, and I know uh, when you guys buy these motorhomes most of the time, you're, you're looking for warmer weather. So if you're in sub-zero temperatures, you haven't gone far enough south. So if you had to use this, you would want to plug this in the night before you're ready to leave, and that is applying to sub-zero temperatures. All right, another thing in here we're going to look at is the air filter and this little gauge here. This is what we call the air minder. This is going to give us the life expectancy of our air filter. So before we ever look at this really and see how it's going, we want to make sure we reset it. Just pushing in on the bottom there, it's a little spring. You push that in and then it'll go down onto the bottom and then we want to go start this again and let it run. Now if this would come up into the red change area, definitely we want to get that change right away. But don't, don't trust this just on coming back here and looking at it after you've driven all day long. Come back here, reset it, and then restart the engine and see how much of a vacuum that pulls into it. The other things we'll talk about is the hitch and the um, connectors here for the hitch. This is your seven-way plug that is pre-wired for an electric brake controller. 
Now you would have to install the brake controller up front in the dash. There is a drop for that. It is pre-wired, pre-wired all the way back to the seven-way connector here. We just need to install the actual brake controller at the dash and you would have availability to use the electric brake. For this connection here, that is the safe hall. And that is done by air. So I believe that this is set up from Spartan primarily for the Air Force One system that would go in your tow vehicle and it supplies air pressure from the chassis braking system and applies to your tow vehicle. So that's something you can check out but that is your quick connect for your safe haul tow. So now that we're done with the engine we're going to walk around to the other side here and start going down the driver's side. All right, now we're on the driver's side. We're going to start from the back and work our way up. This compartment here is for our macerator system. This is the pre-installed macerator hose. It is an inch and a half discharge hose and it is 21 feet long. We're just going to pull out just the end here just to show you how this is set up. So this would just cap would come off. This would go into your dump station or into your city um, hookup if you're there full time. This could just go in there and you would use your macerator hose. Now there is a cutout in the bottom of this compartment that has a turnout cap. You can take that cap, turn that out, and this will fit down through it so that you don't have to have this hanging outside the fender. It would actually come out from underneath and be down underneath the coach here and you could close this door so that it's not kind of blowing around or banging around. Um, one thing is to remember when you go to store this, um, normal procedure for dumping your tanks is, is running your black tank, emptying that out first, cleaning it, and then flushing this hose out with the gray tank. And we've heard a lot um, of comments come back in and say, well, I can't get my macerator hose all the way back in, or how do I get all the fluid out, or how do I get the airlock out of my macerator hose? One little trick that can help you with that is when you get ready to run this back in after all your tanks are emptied, inside your wet bay here, just leave the gray tank valve cracked open just a little bit. That will allow all the air that's trapped in this hose to go back into the gray tank and vent out the roof. That will allow us to shrink that hose down a little bit tighter and get it in with, into that compartment with ease. So we'll move up to the wet bay area. This is going to be our utility center uh, where you're going to hook up your city water. This is where you will have your dump valves. Just several things that are happening in this compartment. We're going to take some time and go through each one of those and point out what they are. So if we start over on this corner here, we're going to talk about this water hose. This is our electric reel water hose. So this will pull out 50 foot, connect up to your post at your station there. And anytime you want to retract this, there is a button here. Just says hose reel. Just retract that and it'll come back in. And it auto retracts on its own there so that it's not locked in place with pressure on it. So that's your hose reel. We do have it pre-plumbed up here. This is coming from the hose reel and goes right into your city connection. All right, there are two connections here. This is going to be your sewer flush and this is your city water connection. We never want to get into a position where we connect these two together with the Y pipe. We've seen some customers doing it. They put a Y pipe here and just use this to do both of them. A couple reasons we don't want to do that sanitation and also because it builds pressure in our sewer hose rinse and we don't want that pressure inside the coach. All right, so speaking of our sewer hose rinse, this is now going to be a sewer tank and a gray tank just depending on the location of this valve. So here at the horizontal position this is going to flush out the black tank. When we turn this to the vertical position we are applying a flush system to the gray water tank. So that is our sewer flush and gray water tank. Down here this blue pipe this is going to be for your drinking water filter. So if you have a refrigerator that has um, water in the refrigerator dispenser and an ice maker that water is all going to be coming through here. Currently right now we have the bypass pipe in, but this would have a filter put in place there. We ship it with a bypass pipe in because we winterize the units before we ship them. So we don't want to put any antifreeze or winterization solution through this filter. So that filter is going to be shipped separately um, just so that you have a good clean filter. In order to change that filter or do any of that to your um, do any maintenance or anything to that line. There is a shutoff valve here, so if we have this in this position currently, this is shut off. To open this up, we would simply turn, and that would open up and allow water to go into your refrigerator and to your drinking water faucet if you have one at the kitchen or maybe in the dispenser of the refrigerator. So we'll just go right across the wall here. This valve here is going to be for your city fill or your fresh water tank. So if we're on city fill, this is the normal operation having this in the vertical position. If we needed to fill our fresh water tank, we would simply turn this to the horizontal position. That will fill the fresh water tank. 
Once the fresh water tank is full, and we can monitor that right over here, when that fresh water tank is full, we will want to turn this valve back to the normal operating position, which is the vertical position. Coming across to our switches, this is the light on and off. Now again, this does have the individual switch in this compartment because it's kind of secluded from the rest of the basement. But in order for this light to work, you will have to have the cargo lights on from switch number one right inside the passenger um, seat there at the entry door. Tank tilt, the empty tank, and the tank tilt system here. This is all governed by the air leveling system. So just in an effort to help you dump those tanks and get all that liquid and debris out of your tanks, if you're dumping your tanks and you're sitting at a dump station or even if you're at a full hookup, you can use this by simply hitting the tilt button. It will drop the driver's side and put some extra air in the passenger side, kind of creating a tilt in the coach. That is the same way that the tanks are angled. So they do angle out here to the driver's side so everything will flow a little bit easier, maybe a little bit faster down to the driver's side to empty out and go through the macerator system. The next switch is for the macerator system. Anytime you're dumping any of these tanks, it is recommended that you use that macerator system and allow that to um, pull everything out of the tank and kind of push that out of the system. It will help you and it does speed up the process of emptying your tanks. The valves here are going to be for each individual tank, the gray water and the black water. Again, in the process of dumping your tanks, we always want to do the black tank first and then wash that black tank out. And then we want to follow that up and flush out um, your hose with your gray water so that we're not using any solids or anything like that in our macerator hose. The monitor panel here is going to be to tell us our um, different levels here. We have the battery, we've got a fresh tank, we've got the gray tank, and we also have the black tank. This also gives you the ability to turn on the water pump from outside. So maybe we walked outside, we need to do some things out here and we don't have the water pump on, we can control that from right here. Going over to this side, there is a two faucets here, an upper and a lower. The upper faucet is for the front. So we did install a quick connect in the front of the coach just to the right of the generator underneath the windshield washer fluid that allows you to use your hose that comes in here and connect to the front it is a 30 foot hose that gives you the ability to wash the front cap. Maybe we got some bugs on there. Uh, just a little bit easier to clean that front end when you guys get to your destination and want to kind of tidy up the coach and clean it up a little bit. So it does have hot and cold water both supplied to that front output. And then this faucet here is obviously going to be for locally inside the wet bay, maybe spraying some hoses off and things. That quick connect will also go in here and you have your hot and cold water control. This guy here is the whole house filter. So this is going to be filtering the entire water system. Anytime we're using this hose here, as we're inputting water in, it is going directly into this filter and filtering before it goes anywhere else in the coach. Also, when you are going to fill your fresh water tank, that water does come through the hose and go through this filter before it goes into the fresh water tank. And like I said on the other side, anytime you use your water pump, you are also going to be filtering that again. So we're going to cycle that water right back through this filter. It's kind of going to get a second filtration um, cycle to it before it gets to your fixtures. Okay, so that covers everything here on the outside of this wall. I'm going to go ahead and take this um, access panel off. We're going to look on the inside and show you some of the valves and things on the inside that you need to be aware of. So once we get inside, we can see the things that we we're talking about earlier that we ship with the coach. This is going to be that 30 foot, that 30 foot um, coiled up extension hose here. That's to put the quick connect here and also to go onto the um, front sprayer as well. This is going to be the sewer connection. Um, we provide the 45 degree angle for underneath the coach. That's for your three inch um, sewer dump. So if you were still using the stinky slinky and you had to do a dump from here, this would go on here and that keeps your hose from going straight down into the ground. Uh, maybe you have a larger connection where you need to get that angle out. Um, so that's going to be in there as well. And then we also have the filters. Um, now, when you guys get your coach, most likely the dealership will have these installed, but these are the filters. This is the purifier drinking filter that will go over here. And then also we have the cartridge that will go into your whole, your whole house filter. So this cartridge here will simply just go inside this canister, and that is your whole house filter. These generally need to be changed out about every six months, depending on how you use your coach. So just kind of follow their instructions as to um, how often you need to change those, depending on, on how you're using the system. So some of the things we want to talk about here behind the wall are these different valves. 
there are going to be two valves here, two what look like gate valves, and they are truly gate valves, but they are the output of the macerator. So this particular one right in the front is for the three inch dump that just comes right out here and goes down underneath the coach. That's where we would have to use the old stinky slinky, um, as we call it, and you'd have to hook up to the bottom of that, and that would allow you to just gravity drain just pretty much everything out of your system. On the back here is the inch and a half macerator drain. So that is the forced output here from the macerator. When you turn the macerator on, it's trying to force everything out, and this is kind of a, a garbage disposal. Um, it just grinds everything up and throws it out that inch and a half hose. We would want to make sure that we have that inch and a half gate valve open on the back right side of the macerator. Now it's important not to have both of those open at the same time because you could really create a mess. Um, anytime you turn the macerator on it will pressurize both outputs. So if we had both of these open regardless of which one you're using, um, you're going to fill the opposite one as well. So if you accidentally left the inch and a half open and you filled your uh, dumped out of your three inch drain here, Unfortunately, you're filling that inch and a half hose that's stored in the fender compartment here and the next time you go to open that up, you, you are going to have a mess on your hands. Um, so try not to do that. Make sure that we only have one of these open at a time and, and preferably the one you're using so you're not creating that mess. Now we'll look at some input valves here. Um, this is going to be our winterizer hose. So you can see that we do have antifreeze in the system already. So the winterizer hose is just simply a clear plastic hose that comes out. You can put it into your solution. So we have a gallon of antifreeze here. We put this into our solution and we turn the valve, point it in the direction so it is lined with the clear hose and the blue hose, and turn the pump on. Once we do that, it will pull the antifreeze solution out of your bottle here and put it to all of your fixtures inside the coach. We're just going to tuck that back in here. That is your winterizer hose there. And now there are a couple more valves here down close to the bottom, those are our low point drains, hot and cold low point drains. So easiest thing to do, you know, let's say we are going to winterize the coach, we would open these up just to remove all the water so we're not pushing water through the system. If we open both of these valves, go upstairs, open a faucet, it breaks that vacuum and allows the air to come into the plumbing system and it'll back drain pretty much a lot of the water other than some of the components, the washer and the dishwasher, things like that, that will hold that inside the component themselves but that should drain most of the water out of the system, then it'd be a whole lot easier and we're taking less antifreeze to get it through the system. Another valve we want to talk about is right here. Um, it is up on the top left here of the wet bay compartment, it is on the output side of the water pump. So the reason we have that valve in there is simply to prevent backflow from the city water into the fresh water tank. Um, oftentimes we would get that call up and say, hey, uh, you know, I'm sitting here at uh, full hookup, been here for three weeks, and I just noticed that my fresh water tank is overflowing after three weeks of sitting here. Well, that could just be a small um, back pressure that's coming through the water pump. Anytime the city water is hooked up, we are creating pressure on the output side of the pump. So if that diaphragm in there or their check valve has any hard water deposits, it creates just a small pinhole, and that allows water to drip through and then backflow into the fresh water tank. So inadvertently, we fill it up and we overflow it. We really don't want to have that situation where we're overflowing that fresh water tank. So be mindful of that. If you're going to be primarily hooked up to city all the time or a full hookup, go ahead and turn that valve off and only turn that valve back on when you need to use the water pump and pull from the fresh water tank. Now there is one more valve in here and it is located just behind the wall. Uh, you can reach up here and if I grab a hold of it here and maybe pull it down a little bit, you can see this valve is really just coming from this inlet to the whole house filter. So if you had your hose reel hooked up and you're um, out at the pedestal, it's hooked up to water pressure, you could come right here. Maybe we're having an issue not getting enough water pressure and we wanna check our filter here to make sure that we um, have a clean filter or that we don't have a, um, any kind of blockage or anything in that filter. So we can close this valve here. It cuts off the incoming water to the system and release the pressure through the low points here and then we would be able to take this filter housing off and check that cartridge. Now it's just a, just another valve there so that you don't have to go and turn the post off, unhook your, your hose or anything to relieve the pressure. We can do all of that from right here in the wet bay. So I'm going to go ahead and close this up. Um, we've been through everything that's in the wet bay, and then we'll pick up in the next bay forward. So now that we're done with the wet bay, we're going to move forward to the next compartment where we are going to have our shore cord. Um, this is going to be our power supply coming in, and then obviously our aqua hot as well. So let's take a minute and talk about our shore cord. You can see that we are already plugged in and we do have a series of adapters here um, because we don't have 50 amp service where we're recording here today. 
we are going from a 50 amp adapter to the 30 amp adapter and then down to the 110 here and then plugged into an extension cord. So, so there are some, some procedures that you need to follow when doing this. Um, there's some settings on the screen which we'll show you here in a little bit on the Vega Touch screen that you need to change and, and make, um, make acceptable so that it can use this power. Um, we don't want to draw too much power through this extension cord because that could lead to bad things on the extension cord and for your breaker um, inside your facility that you're plugged into. So on the transfer um, switch and the shore cord, um, it is recommended that you guys get a external surge guard and that would plug into your shore cord here. That's just a protection um, to go around the shore cord. Um, we want to see that because they are auto resetting. We do have a surge guard in our transfer switch. However, that is like a one time use. Uh, once that takes in a spike on it or has any damage done to it, that transfer switch needs to be replaced. So it is in your best benefit to um, get the external surge guard and utilize that when you're plugging in. Now, before we ever plug this in um, or plug the external surge guard into a pedestal somewhere, we want to make sure that the post breaker is turned off. We never want to plug this into a live circuit. So always have that post breaker turned off. And then once we're plugged in, go ahead and turn that post breaker back on. Your external surge guard, if you're utilizing that, will it will check out that pedestal and do all of its um, safety checks before it ever connects. And then it connects all four contacts at the same time. So that's really what we want to see there. The one thing about this, um, the shore cord, we have had some customers call in and say, hey, does it matter if we have that shore cord completely extended? You know, do I have to have that pulled out all the way before I can use it? The answer to that is no. It can be rolled out, you know, two feet, three feet, 10 feet, or 30 feet, which is the maximum extension of that uh, power cord. The one thing you want to remember, though, is do not move that. Do, don't retract it or don't pull it out while the unit's powered up. Um, if, if, if for any reason we need to move that or maybe pull that hose out to get it out of the way of something else or maybe maintenance is coming through and doing some work and you need to move it over so you need an extra hose out or extra um, electric line out, go ahead and turn that off, power down the coach, turn off the pedestal breaker before we move that so we don't create any damage inside the shore cord. So moving over to the aqua system, um, this is a diesel fired aqua system so there is some maintenance to this. Um, annual maintenance to this is going to be the fuel filter which is up top here that will need to be changed out and also the um, diesel burner nozzle so the fuel nozzle inside will need to be changed out as well and they normally go in there and clean that burner chamber clean all the soot and stuff out of it from the diesel burning um, so that's going to be a yearly maintenance the all the time maintenance really when we say all the time it's constant maintenance on this is just to verify that we have enough propylene glycol in the system so by checking this recovery tank here, we can see that this one is a little bit low right now. We normally want to see this in between the cold and the hot line, and we want to check that when it is up to temperature, when it is actually warm. That fluid expands when it's warm, so we want to check it when it is uh, being used and it's hot and that temperature has expanded in there. So the solution that's in there is propylene glycol, boiler antifreeze, it's transfer fluid, and mixed with 50-50 um, distilled water. So we want to make sure that we are using the correct fluid. It's propylene glycol. We are currently using Sentry fluids here at the factory. So it's best to have some of that on hand um, and also to have just, just a regular gallon of distilled water. Um, anytime you need to go and fill this up, especially recent purchases, you know, right after you purchase it and you get down the road four or five months, you come down and check this and it seems to be low. Um, the reason that it's probably low is because the water has evaporated out of the system. It does have an overflow on it. So it does have the ability to uh, evaporate some of that fluid out of it. So we want to make sure we're replacing that with the distilled water. The propylene glycol really is not going to evaporate as much as the distilled water will. So you're okay if you get in the situation where this is low, just to go ahead and add straight distilled water to the system. We can do up to about a gallon of distilled water before we need to run that propylene glycol in there. That kind of keeps that mixture, the propylene glycol to water mixture in the right place where we need it to be. Another thing back here is the reporter. So this is the little black screen back there. It is an LCD screen. So just touch the screen, it comes on. That will give you the operation of the aqua. So that will show you what current state it's in. If it's on, it'll show you the status. It will also give you the faults. If there's any fault here or anything that it recognizes is, is wrong with the system, it will give you a fault and it'll give us an easier way to maintain and troubleshoot that aqua hot should something go wrong. That reporter is also duplicated on the Vega Touch screen inside, so we will show you that when we go over the Vega Touch screen. 
One more thing about the aquapod is going to be the water lines, the domestic water lines here. You'll see the red and blue lines and there are valves on those red and blue lines. It kind of makes an H back there. That is a water heater bypass. The reason that is important is for sanitation. Anytime we're sanitizing the uh, water system in the coach, if you're using a chlorinated solution, any kind of bleach or anything like that, we want to make sure we bypass the aqua hot because we do not want that chlorine or bleach solution inside the aqua hot. The internal water lines of the aqua hot are copper. Um, if you know anything about science or have done any science fair projects in your past, you know that bleach and chlorine do not mix very well with copper. So one thing to, to maintain and understand that we don't want to sanitize that aqua hot system. Now, for winterizing, it's a completely different story. We do want to winterize this aqua. So if you get in the situation where you are going to winterize this coach, make sure that you run antifreeze through the hot water supply lines of your faucets and make sure that it fills the aqua hot up. That domestic hot water line is creating a loop around the burner in the aqua hot, so it always holds water in the bottom of that coil. You will want to make sure that we get antifreeze in there to prevent that from freezing inside the aqua hot. All right, so there's two other things in here that we'll talk about. That is on the side of this electrical box here. There is a um, port there for your part cable. So if you were hooked up to cable at the pedestal and you had part cable, maybe you're there at a resort full time and they offer that cable, um, you would want to connect that coax cable there. And also there's one that says um, yard dish or satellite dish. That is going to be for an external satellite dish. Let's say we, we are putting the traveler satellite on the roof and you're in a place where you don't have clear view of the satellites and maybe some heavy tree cover or something over your coach, particularly where you parked. If you had a yard dish, tailgate or anything like that, you can simply hook that up, set it up outside here, get it into an area where it gets signal, and then we would just hook that coax wire to the connection here, and that automatically runs it to our entertainment center where you can plug that right into the back of your receiver and use satellite signal from your yard dish rather than from the satellite on the roof. So we're gonna go ahead and move forward to the next compartment and show you the vacuum. The central vacuum system located on the driver's side here. Access is through this little hatch. Just to open this up, you will find that the bag is installed. Now before you guys use that central vac system, we want to make sure that you do install that bag. Uh, we do not do that here at the factory. The dealership may do that for you uh, when they're prepping the unit, but make sure that you take those instructions out and put that bag in as well. And note what size bag that is so that you can get replacements when that's full. We'll go ahead and move up to the next compartment. I want to show you guys the slide out motors and what we would do with a slide out motor in an emergency. There's several different things that we can do, um, but we're just going to show you a little bit about that slide out system. Um, it is going to be the same slide out system across the entire coach. So same motor that goes in um, every room and each room has its own slide out motor. So in, in getting access to this, the, the front two slide outs are accessible in the basement. You can reach them right here in the basement. They're just fully accessible. The bed slide motor is going to be underneath the bed, so just lift up the storage hatch on the bed lid and you'll have access to that motor. The vanity slide is usually the hardest one to get to. That motor is actually located inside the floor in between the drive and tag axle. So you're going to have to access that one from outside. It is a little, probably the most difficult motor to get to. Um, and we seal it up in a metal pan. It's got sealing all the way around it, so we seal that cavity up. It, it's, it's a little bit difficult to get in there. Um, but if you had to, um, you know where it's at in between the drive and tag axle. So we're just going to take a look at the motor here, give you, give you a couple ideas of things that you can look for should something go wrong. It is just a centrally located motor here, has two shafts, cross shaft on each side. So that's what's driving your slide out are these cross shafts. And then you'll notice that there are two shear pins here. There's one on either side of the motor, there's one here, and there's also one over here on the other side. Should you have any issues with your slide out, Maybe the motor quit working or the brake is locked up and we can't get it to move. Um, there's a couple options here. This is kind of the, the drop dead emergency situation. We could simply pull these shear pins out, take the cotter pin out, push the shear pin out, and then this room is free floating. Uh, what I mean by free floating is you can physically push these rooms in. So it may take a little bit of effort, especially on the super slide trying to get up the hill. You know, here in our factory service center, it takes us six or seven guys to push that up in the hill. And then once we get it in, it's, it's two or three people when it's on a level surface. Um, you can get that room pushed all the way in, and once you do get it in, you want to make sure that you secure the room in place, either by A, putting these shear pins back in, or B, attaching something to this cross shaft. We use vice grips here. Just simply attach vice grips here, 
make sure that it's wedged up against the floor, and that'll kind of lock this room in place, and then it's, it would be safe to drive to the dealership or a facility to get that repaired. Um, it keeps that slide out from rolling out when you turn a corner. The other thing is the wiring for this is just simple DC motor. So as we're looking at the wires here, and we follow this back, you're going to have some connections here. If it was an issue where maybe the controller wasn't working or we had a, a fuse or a relay that was out and we couldn't find it, we can simply come right here to this connection. We can pull this apart and we can operate this motor just with a 12 volt power source. So whether it's a battery charger or a cordless screw gun battery, you can attach it right to those wires. You'd be using the black and the red. And because it is a DC motor, it's reverse polarity. So if it's going the wrong direction, you would just simply change those wires around positive to negative and you can get that motor to run in opposite directions. So just wanted to give you an overview. They are the same footprint, so if you needed to exchange a motor from, let's say the driver's side quit, but the passenger side was good, you could exchange that motor, take the passenger side motor, put it on the driver's side, simply by removing the four bolts here on the side of the motor, those four bolts come out, take the shear pins out, this shaft here will slide over, and then this motor will drop right down out of this cradle, and you can put any one of the motors, any four, uh, any one of the four motors in the coach will actually go right here and fit in the same exact spot to operate that room. So that kind of sums it up for the slide out motors and their locations. We're going to move forward and talk about our Gerard awnings and our Starlink system. In this next compartment, you're going to see an access panel here. Behind this access panel, we do have our Starlink system and our Gerard awning. So we'll start with our Gerard awnings, just Velcro it on here, pull that down. These two junction boxes here provide the power to your Gerard awnings. These two controllers are the RF controllers. So that's the Vega touches operating through RF and also the handheld remote we showed on the other side is just RF to those controllers. They are pre-programmed to operate the front and the rear awning. So that would be where we need to go. If we, maybe we need to reprogram everything. That's, there's a way to sync those up. On the Starlink system, this is our Starlink system um, installed. We do have the antenna already installed on the roof. This device here is the power supply, and this is the router. So the power supply has got to be plugged in. The antenna comes down from the roof and plugs into the power supply. And then there's a Ethernet cable that goes from the power supply to the router. So this would provide wireless connectivity. Um, you can connect any device to that Starlink router, and you can have the internet on that device. Now we do run an extra cable in here. That is this cable right here. We keep it taped up. And this is just an Ethernet cable because we are installing a Wi-Fi Ranger that's really a Wi-Fi extender system um, in the coach. And that's what our network is tied to. So the Vega Touch screens, um, some of the dash screens and things are tied to that network. If you wanted to provide the internet to those screens or to that network, simply using this cable here would plug into the power supply. We would remove the Starlink router plug this in, and this exact same end is on the other side where the Wi-Fi Ranger is installed. You would simply plug that into port one of the Wi-Fi Ranger. So that would give you the Starlink internet source directly to the Wi-Fi Ranger, creating wireless internet to every component that we have tied to the network in the coach. So that's our Starlink system there. I'm just gonna go ahead and throw this access panel back up. And then we'll talk about the next item in this compartment. So you'll see that there's storage here and then just forward of the storage there's a black access panel. This is an access panel for the leveling system. So our equalizer leveling pump is located behind this panel. Remove about six screws you'd have access to that. So the reason we want you to know where that's at, number one it does have a fluid reservoir back there. You'd want to be checking that fluid occasionally. Normally you're not going to have any issue with the fluid unless of course you see a leak somewhere. Leak is primarily going to be noticeable at the jack leg itself. So maybe you move your coach out and you see a little puddle there that where the jacks were. That's an indication we need to check that level of your equalizer leveling system. The other reason you would want to get into this compartment is if there was an issue with the jacks and they wouldn't retract. There is an emergency retract procedure. So on this leveling system, there are four solenoids that you would just open the valves on the four solenoids. And then on the end of the pump, it's going to be a little sticker. We take that sticker off and there's access there to the motor bolt where we can force that motor to run with the cordless screw gun. We've got all the instructions for that in your black satchel. That's going to be included with the coach. So we're going to go ahead and leave this area here and go up to the front fender, discuss what's in that front fender electrical panel access underneath the driver's seat.
So in our front fender here, there's going to be a couple components that we want to talk about. Obviously, we have our light switch. This is going to turn our light on and off. And then our leveling control panel. So this is the equalizer leveling control. It is a smart level control. It is Bluetooth, so equalizer does have an app that you can download to your device. And then you would simply connect to that controller and you could operate the leveling jacks from your device. This fuse panel as well. There are going to be fuses in here, and this is a split fuse panel, so understand that some of these are constant power. The top is constant power. Anytime we have the battery disconnects on in the back, um, this is going to have constant power to it. And then this bottom section here is for the ignition sources. That is only going to be active, so these bottom fuses here are only going to be active when the ignition is on. So remember that if we're checking these fuses for power, they're only going to have power to them if the ignition is on. So I'm going to put this on here, get that out of the way for us. This handle here is our T handle to open the generator door, so we'll show you some more things in the generator door as well. But then I want to show you another access panel here. This little carpeted tab is to access the panel inside this fender. Now there's a reason we're putting this on there. We kind of tidy that up a little bit, but there are a couple connections on here that we don't want you to mess with. But there are also things that you will probably have to get to inside this compartment. Number one thing that you may need to get to is this black box here. So this is just a cover panel. It's got four thumb screws on it where we can take off that cover panel. And that is the power distribution center for your chassis. That's going to have things like the Trimark keyless entry system fuses, um, the ignition fuse, different headlights and things like that will be fused and relays in there as well. Should we run into any issues or have Spartan on the phone, they say, hey, we need to check this fuse or, or maybe we need to pull these fuses to reset the system. This is where you're going to go to access those fuses. Just on top of this fuse panel, there is a series of breakers here. There should be four breakers down there. Um, it's important to know where those are at because they are manual reset breakers. And the reason you will need to know that is if for any reason you short something out in your driver or passenger seat, those are the breakers for the driver and passenger seat. So those are manual. Um, anytime you get in a situation where something doesn't operate on the driver or passenger seat, it's just a good idea to come down here, check that breaker, and make sure that breaker is not tripped. So, I'm going to go ahead and put this access panel back, and then we're going to open up this generator door and take a look inside the generator itself. One key thing about this door before we walk away is the proper way to close this. Normally, most of the baggage doors you see me close, and we just gave it a good slam and it would close and seal. This one is a little bit different because we do have a tighter bulb seal. We want to keep that airtight and watertight. So the proper way to close this door is simply by pushing the door closed and putting pressure in the center of the door. I usually like to just put my knee into it. You'll hear it click and then that door is sealed. Now that we've pulled the hatch and the generator slide is coming out, you notice that I did this both from the top and the bottom. It's important to have pressure on both. I always use my foot. You can lean down and grab the bottom of that door. But the one thing you want to do is make sure you have equal pressure so that you're pulling this door out evenly. We don't want to just pull on the top. We don't want to just pull on the bottom. That could get it out of alignment. So anytime we're moving this door, make sure we have equal pressure on the top and the bottom. Once we have this access door extended, there's a couple things that we want to show you inside the generator hood. Number one is the generator itself. There is the start and stop right here in an hour meter. And there's also a breaker here. So this is your 50 amp breaker. Um, a lot of times we get a phone call that says, hey, we just left the Cummins facility and we have no power coming from the generator. A lot of times that's due because as they're working on this or servicing their generator, they will turn this breaker off and then they don't turn it back on when they're done. So it's just a matter of coming down, checking that breaker. If it is off, just go ahead and turn that breaker back on. That should supply power back to the coach. The other things that are going to be inside here, windshield washer fluid reservoir, uh, make sure we keep that full. That's going to be used to wash the windshield off. And then this connection port right here. Um, when we were in the wet bay utility center, we were talking about a way to clean off the front cap with a hose up front. And that top valve there goes to this hose. This is the quick connect right here. Just has your quick connect, so you would just bring your hose up here, connect it inside there, and then this has a cover on it just to keep it out of the road debris and anything that's coming in it. So that kind of everything that's down here visible that you can get to, that's kind of wrapping up a little bit of here. There's one more thing here that we'd like to show you, and that is going to be the cab air filter. So straight up here um, inside this front cap, there is an air filter on your dash air conditioner. Um, that is when we pull outside air in, we want to run that through a filter. So 
Eventually, you're going to need to change that out. We're going to tell you probably between 6 to 12 months. You'll need to get down there and check it and clean that out. It is a paper cartridge, so it's going to need to be changed more often, just like the filter in your car, per se, um, that you would change in your cab air filter or change your air filter for the engine in the car. You want to do that on an annual basis. So kind of make sure, check that, you know, depending on how you're using your coach and how often you're using that, we want to go ahead and change that filter out. So I'm going to go ahead and close this back up. There is a small T-handle here that this locks in place. You will want to pull the T-handle out. Just give this a little nudge. Again, like I said, we never want to push just on one location. So I went ahead and unlocked that. And then I want to put this in with equal pressure. So I'm just going to give it equal pressure here and then here. Now, once it goes in, we want to make sure that this latch is. The latch is on this side of it. So normally, we just come over, give it one little push here, and that latches that in place so that this is secured. All right, now that we've finished the outside walk around, we're going to go ahead and step inside and we're going to do the walk around on the inside. But before we go in, we just want to talk about the entry steps and some of the things here and the entryway. Our entry steps are controlled by a magnet in the door. When you open and close the door, those entry steps will come in and out. There is a switch located just inside the door that says step power that will disable that function. So what that means is it will not run the steps in and out when you close the door. The exception to that is going to be if the ignition is on. So if you turn the ignition is on, um, regardless of what that switch is in, when you close the door and that ignition is on, per se, you're driving down the road, that will automatically store these steps for you. So that is just kind of a safety override there, but you have the ability to lock these steps in this position. So as you're um, stationed at your resort, your campground, whatever you're doing there, um, if you're there full time living in it, you can leave these steps out going in and out of the coach. They're not going in and out, and you're not waiting for those to come out when you open the door. Another thing in the steps here is going to be the storage drawer right here. So this is just for smaller items, um, maybe a tire chuck, some gloves and stuff for fueling, dog leashes, doggy bags, things like that can be stored in here. Definitely don't want to be storing, storing any of your gold bricks in there. Um, it's a little too heavy for the drawer guides and it may come out while you're driving down the road and then could be a tripping hazard uh, when you go to step out of the coach. Another thing on this uh, passenger side council here is going to be the main power switch. So that is providing 12 volt power to inside the coach that activates the solenoid down in the basement. It does have the little red LED light next to it, so that's your indicator that that is on. Um, now, that is not truly a battery disconnect, that is more so as a 12 volt reset for the inside components of the coach. So you may be talking to tech support, one of our phone techs, or maybe the Firefly tech support, or even Valid tech support, and they may ask you, hey, can you do a power, a 12 volt power reset for us? What they're referring to is this switch just inside the entry door, just turn that off, count to 10, turn that switch back on, and that kind of resets it. No, Really no different than resetting a computer um, or a cell phone just doing a restart on your screen on your computer. This is essentially doing the exact same thing there. A couple more um, things that are on here is going to be the step light. So when we use the step light switch, that is going to provide lighting to the step. We do have lighting all the way around, and that also controls the light underneath. So maybe you're going to be gone and want to come back and have some lighting at the steps you'll want to have that step light switch on so that it provides light underneath the coach for those steps. Another switch that's just inside here is going to be the multiplex switch. On that multiplex switch, there are several things that operate. We have a master light switch. We have the entry light switch. It will control your awning lights and the cargo lights, things like that, that you will need to control right here from the front entry steps. The master light switch is going to control all the lights on the inside. That does have a memory in it. So, if you were to walk out of the unit and maybe you had four or five lights on inside the coach, you would simply just hit the off button. And what that will do is it will memorize what state that's in. Now, when you come back to the coach, just simply press the on button one time and that will come back to the same memory. So those four or five lights that you had on are the only thing that come on at that point. If you wanted to turn everything on in the coach, all the lights on to 100%, simply press and hold that master light switch for approximately three seconds and it will bring everything up to full light and you'll have 100% um, lighting on every light in the coach. All right, so we're going to go ahead and step inside. We're going to go up and talk about the passenger side overhead and just kind of go around the cockpit and show you the things and features inside the coach. All right, so now that we're inside, we're going to go ahead and talk about some of the features here and some of the things you'll need to understand and know inside these overhead compartments. First, inside the passenger side overhead compartment, there are three uh, controls up here. The wine guard Razor antenna, that is going to be your off-air antenna. So that is a HD antenna system, but that's for local channels off air and also for your part cable that is controlled through there. Um, so to operate this, just simply press turn it on. It will automatically search that dish up uh, on the roof. will start rotating. You'll hear it a little bit rotate. 
and then it will search for local channels. Now it brings up a number here when it locks on place. It'll bring up a number. This is telling us right now we're inside a building, so it's not going to be as great. But this is showing us that it has all locked on to six channels. Uh, we can adjust this. Uh, maybe we need to do a little fine tuning. We still got a little haze or a little snow or the picture is cutting in and out. We can manually adjust this by the arrows here at the bottom. Or we can just go ahead and do another search by simply hitting the search button. Now, that will give you off-air antenna. If you wanted to use part cable, this controller needs to be in the off position so the part cable can just flow through it, kind of like a pass-through situation, rather than powering that coax cable. Uh, when we power the coax cable, trying to look for um, cable, uh, cable TV or part cable, it's not going to give you any signal. You'll just get little fuzzy snow lines on your screen. Um, so make sure this is turned off if you want to use your uh, part cable. The next control in here is going to be for your slide outs. That is your slide out switches for extend and retract. Each one of them is labeled separately with an extend and a retract. Now the key thing is, is how you operate your slide outs. And that's one of the things we kind of want to pause and talk about here. Um, while you can operate all four slide outs at the same time, it's not ideal. That's not really how we want it to be um, set up. We want you to run one slide out at a time. And here's the process of doing that. For Integra Coach, all of our slide outs need to be ran while the vehicle is in ride height. That's probably one of the most important things you can get out of talking about slide outs is when to operate them and how to know that they're all the way out or all the way in. Um, so when to operate them is only at ride height. So the startup procedure or setup procedure when you pull into a campground or you're in a back through site or a pull through site is that you want to first make sure the coach is at ride height. So as soon as you turn the engine off, make sure that it's at ride height and then you're okay and it's safe to run your slide outs in and out. So only at ride height, we can't say that enough, it's very important that we only run those slide outs at ride height. Once we're at ride height, then you can go ahead and level the coach, use the leveling system, and bring the coach to a different level that you need. All right, now how do we know that the slide out is all the way in or all the way out? Well, that's one of the important things about running them one at a time. There's not per se a limit on these where you hold the button and it goes out and stops on its own. That's not the ideal case. Um, the ideal case that we want to see you do is listening to that motor. And it's all going to be determined by the pitch or the, the change in the sound of that motor. You can press the extend button and as soon as that motor starts to make a change or you hear that motor start to bog down, that's the indication that that room is all the way out and sealed. It has made contact with the outside seal and it is in its sealed location. We never really want to hold that button until it stops on its own and you hear that click at the end. Uh, we've, we've at that point applied too much pressure to the outside wall and to the fascia board. So, important uh, process of how to operate and run those slide outs. Now, if you were getting ready to leave, that teardown procedure is, is going to be kind of opposite of what it was when we set up. When we go to leave, the slide outs are going to be one of the last things we do before we actually pull out of our campsite because we want the engine to be running and we want this coach to be at ride height again. So that means you need to start your engine, go to high idle, and then retract the jacks. Once the jacks are up, we can confirm that we're at ride height, and then once ride height is achieved, we can go ahead and run all these rooms in. Again, making sure that we don't overextend or over retract those rooms is very important. The next thing in this overhead here is going to be the air conditioner overrides. Those are the emergency overrides for your AC system. Um, again, these are emergency only use. This is not to be used for normal operation because what this control panel does is it bypasses all the safeties on the air conditioner. In the event that you have a Vega Touch issue, uh, maybe the screen on the inside has failed or, or maybe we think there's something wrong with an air conditioner. Uh, we can simply go to this override switch and we can test the air conditioner to make sure it works. Maybe we use this a lot in troubleshooting when uh, customers call in and say, hey, I don't know that I have power. Well, let's go up and hit each one of these. If you have power to your coach, each one of these will run. Uh, but the key is we only want to run these one at a time and we don't want to run them for more than 30 minutes. And the reason for that is because we are bypassing all of the safety features in the air conditioner. Uh, we're bypassing the pressure switch, we're bypassing the uh, freeze sensor that goes on the evaporator, and good chances are if you're in hot weather you need to use this override, um, you're in a situation where you're going to build moisture on that evaporator and it's going to freeze up. And once it freezes up, if we're not controlling that pressure switch, the compressor is going to see a drop in pressure and we could get into the point where we freeze the compressor up. So we want to be very cautious of that. So if we do have to get in a situation for using these, um, we're going to turn on the front air conditioner, run it for 30 minutes, turn that off, turn on the second air conditioner, run it for 30 minutes, turn that one off, and then we can switch to the third. Just kind of stay in that rotation and that, that plan of just using one at a time. And it is going to, while it's not going to be as cold as you'd like it probably to be, it is going to create airflow throughout the entire coach because our ductwork is continuously connected throughout the coach from the back 
to the front is the exact same duct and they are connected throughout the entire coach. So if the front air conditioner is running, you are going to get airflow out of the rear vents. Just not as much pressure, probably not as ideal and not as much as you want, but it is going to create that situation for you. So that is all the controls here in the passenger um, side overhead. We're gonna move to the front overhead here. And what we will have in here is going to be our, our WineGuard Traveler control. So this is controlling the WineGuard satellite antenna. This is for your high definition satellite. And this is the fold down dish that is on the roof. So to activate this, we would hit this, this power button here. That will come on and you'll get a display here on the screen. Now, one key thing about this is it will search for its own signal. It will lock on its own signal when you put a satellite receiver in. It will find that satellite signal lock on it. But what we don't want to do is forget that that is up when you guys go to leave or travel. Um, so to get this to go down and power this down, press and hold the power button until it says powering down. And it'll go through the whole process and tell you on the screen that is in the process of stowing. And then once it is completely stowed down in place, it will say stowed on the screen and then that power will shut off on its own. So it'll go back to a state like this right here where it just has backlighting on the switches. Some of the other controls in here are going to be your front overhead TV. Um, now there are several remotes in the coach. Each remote is labeled for its uh, specific TV. So make sure you grab the right remote for that. There are some things that can happen with this front TV um, uh, surrounding our dash area. So we're, we're gonna talk about that when we get into all this digital dash stuff and how it connects to the overhead TV as well. So we'll move over here to our driver's front overhead. This is gonna be our Trimark keyless entry system. This is the control box for that. It will have all of your serial numbers and everything for Trimark. Um, that's important to know. If you ever had an issue with a key fob, you'll wanna um, let Spartan know or Trimark know what those serial numbers are so they can plan accordingly to getting you new parts and programmed. Um, but this control um, here, just two switches in this uh, overhead, both for the Trimark system, one is going to be for programming the key fob. So if you ever had a key fob that lost its sync, you know, um, there's processes and that things that happen. Maybe the battery goes out and it had been sitting too long and it, it would lose its sync with the system. You, that's where you'd have to resync it. Um, we, we did time this out at one point. It was, if you were away from the coach outside of reception of this box, if you hit one of those buttons on that key fob approximately more than 60 times, which most of you probably won't do unless you let your grandkids have your keys, um, that could possibly lose sync as well. Um, so just, just uh, the left button on here is for your key fob. Hit that button three times. So you just hit it three times and then you can press any uh, button on your key fob and that will sync it back to the Trimark. Now, understand if you have to do that situation, you need to have both of your key fobs there present at the same time. And if, if you have added key fobs to it, maybe three or four key fobs, uh, whatever the case is, all key fobs need to be there present at the same time so that they all have the same sync process and get synced up to that Trimark control box. The other switch up here is for the keypad authority. We talked about this outside when we first started with this walkthrough on how to program your own keypad access code. Now to program your access code, you had to have the authority code. Our authority code default on uh, the Integra coach is the number four, five times. So again, that's across the board for everyone. We really encourage you to change that authority code so that I don't know your authority code when I see you at a campground or a rally or anything. I can't just randomly come up and change your keyless entry access and lock you out of your coach. While it would be fun, um, that's not really what we're looking forward to doing. So we would encourage you to change your keypad authority code. Simply just press this button one time and then you'll need to go out to the keypad outside. Now you only have five seconds to do that. So it may be best to have two people, uh, maybe one of you outside and one of you come in and hit the button. That keypad will beep and flash, and then you need to enter your new five digit authority code. So whatever you choose, it's gotta be numbers one through four, but it needs to be five digits. Uh, once you enter five digits, it'll beep twice, and then you need to enter those same five digits again to confirm it. Um, that's really the only steps there are to um, changing that authority code, and then it allows you to change access codes as well. So something to keep in mind, um, we do encourage you to change that authority code on your own. Inside the driver's side overhead here are going to be two breaker panels. And we'll talk about these coming in. Um, this first one here on the left is going to be your main breaker panel. That is controlled by shore power and generating. So well, what that simply means is anything in this breaker box will only operate if you have the shore power connected or we're running the generator. Now that's what we mean by main breaker box. It requires that incoming power from those devices before any of these will operate. So now that's, that's gonna require um, Shore power or generator operate, that's gonna be things like your stove, um, your electric element in the water heater, um, 
the air conditioners, the washer dryer, things like that are all controlled by main power coming in. We would never have those on an inverted circuit. So the other box over here on the right is going to be your inverted circuit. So anything in this breaker box is on an inverted circuit, which simply means this. You don't have to have shore power present. You don't have to have the generator running. And these components will operate. That's going to be things like your microwave, your dishwasher, the refrigerator, of course, um, your TVs. And there are, are numerous outlets throughout the coach that are also on an inverted circuit. So you don't necessarily have to be plugged in uh, all the 110 outlets around the cockpit area. So if you needed to charge a cell phone or, or a computer or anything like that while you were driving, you could plug it in here at one of the councils and those outlets are inverted as well. So the inverter is going to operate and there is a safety built into there. We do have a low battery cutout. Should your batteries ever reach 10.7 volts while your inverter is running, that inverter will automatically turn itself off and that's really a protection built in just for those batteries so that we don't flatline or run those batteries completely dead. One thing to remember about these breaker boxes, um, this is just a plastic latch here and it does need to be latched in place. We've had several calls. Um, we, we've got this rattle in the front of our coach. We can't determine what it is and most of the time it's going to be one of these. Um, just in as, in as an example, if this is not latched and you're driving down the road, you, you may start to get this little chatter as you're driving. So make sure that these are kind of sealed up and closed off, latched in place so that you don't get that rattle while you're driving. So now that we're done with the overhead stuff, we're going to uh, take a look at our driver and passenger seats. Um, now these are both going to have the same function. They both have a footrest. Um, the passenger side footrest can be used in the forward facing position or turned around in the reverse position. The driver side, um, while it has a footrest on it, we encourage you only to use that footrest while that chair is turned around facing the back of the coach. Um, there is a safety built into that so that that doesn't run when the key is on. But the operation of these seats, they do all move forward and they do all swivel. So the key operation is anytime you want to swivel the seat that you run the seat all the way forward. So I'm just going to go ahead and take the time here, run the seat all the way forward and show you how the seat swivels. Uh, once we get it all the way forward, there is a small lever on the opposite side of the seat. You simply pull up on this lever and that allows you to swivel the seat around and face the rear of the coach. Now you can position this however you want. Now you can run it back. You can run the back of the seat, recline it back a little bit, and then maybe run the footrest out. Um, key thing is that it's always in the forward facing position before you swivel it. And also another uh, tip about the chairs is anytime you're using your slide outs, make sure that this back here is forward enough that we're not getting inter any interference with a slide out. Um, we, we do put in all of our literature that they need to be as far forward and and fully in the upright position. Um, so that is kind of the key thing there. Really just let's make sure that we have the clearance here. And they don't necessarily have to be in the full forward position, but it is a great idea to have these um, in a forward position when you're running the slide outs, just to make sure that we want to make sure that there is clearance here in between that slide out and the chair so that we're not doing any damage to the chair or the slide out. So that kind of wraps up the cockpit area here. We're going to go ahead and move back into the coach and get into our living room and uh, we'll show you some of the features here and some of the things you'll need to learn about in the living room. So we have the switch panels on the wall here. That's going to operate the things here in the front. There is a light master on here as well. Um, our entry lights and then the panel lights where we can turn the backlighting off. But moving on past into this, um, we do have our hide -a bed So this is a sofa system with a hide -a bed And we'll show you, just take a quick second here and show you how we need to access this um, and get into this hide -a bed and extend that out the proper way. Um, if it is equipped with an air mattress, we need to give you a few tips and trades about the air mattress as well. Um, the one thing to remember is anytime you're going to store this, we want to make sure that the air mattress is completely deflated and the cap is left off. So I'm just going to go ahead and take the time to move the cushions here off and we'll show you how to extend this hide -a bed and get this into a place of using the bed. When we have all the cushions removed, there's a handle right here in the center. We can simply pull up on this. And once it comes up into position, we can pull this mattress out. Now it does have an arm that extends down here at the bottom that will take place and sit on the ground. Once that is set in place, simply grabbing the center here, will lift up the last leg. And this just folds over and does this. Now, if the bed, the mattress is deflated properly, it's gonna end up something like this. This simply just folds out and then we'll clip into place here on the retainer at the end of the mattress. Once you have that clipped in, it's okay to go ahead and access our air pump here. 
we would hook up our air pump and plug this in. There is an outlet there at the kitchen wall that we can air up this mattress. Again, when we're done, we want to make sure that we take all the air out, let all that air out, and we want to leave that cap off so that it doesn't trap anything in there. The key is, if you were to get into any high altitudes and there's air in this, you fold it up, it's got pressure in it, it could burst the bladder on the inside of the mattress. So we want to avoid doing that. So we're going to go ahead and store this back up. Once we have all the air out of it, again, just lift up on the bottom here. This is going to come down and make sure that we lock this bar into place. So it is going to put a little pressure. And when we have the cap open here, that allows the air to release out of that mattress. Once we have that locked in place, it's simply just pushing this back into place where it was. And then we can return all of our cushions so we have use of our sofa again. All right, so sofa's back in place. Now we'll talk about some of the components here behind us. This is the TV, it is on a televator. The switch to operate that televator is gonna be on the opposite wall here because normally you're gonna be over here watching TV. So we'll just go ahead and lift this up just to show you how this works. Um, using the switch over here, that's gonna lift the television up and then you would have access to your televator. Obviously that will come up a little bit higher for, for the video, we're just gonna leave it here. The sound bar located just above the TV is going to be your primary source of sound from the TV and anything we have feeding through the TV. Um, and when we talk about things feeding through the TV, that's gonna be in this compartment here. Our matrix system and our Blu-ray player, those are already tied to the TV. The matrix system is four inputs and four outputs. So the key to this is that we can simply plug in this DVD player, which the DVD player in this compartment is wired directly to the matrix. And then that allows you to play that DVD at all four locations in the coach. That's all four TVs outside front and bedroom, plus your living room. On the matrix itself, we do hook up the Blu-ray player and the dash radio. So the dash radio is also available to view here on your TV. In doing so, you can um, bring your cameras to the TV, you can see your navigation on the TVs, and then you can also have your Sirius radio displayed when you are on that Sirius radio. You should be able to see that and see what station you're on and play those from different areas in the sound bars in the coach. On the Satellite receiver, this is um, something that we want to mention that it is highly advisable that you connect your satellite receiver to your matrix. That way you could use that same satellite and have that same picture anywhere throughout the coach. Now that is going to be up to you or up to the dealer as to how they hook that up. We leave that input blank on the back of the matrix so you would be able to set that up. We also leave um, the fourth input is blank as well. It's labeled as auxiliary and that's for you guys to put something in um, of your choice really if it's HDMI. We've had customers put an Apple TV in. We've had some customers put a PlayStation in. Um, you can do digital photography. If you have it on an HDMI source, like a digital uh, photo frame that has an HDMI output, you can plug that into your matrix. We've also had people doing the uh, fire sticks and things of that nature. So anything that has an HDMI output can be broadcast through the matrix to be on all four TVs at the same time. So also some of the things that are in this compartment here, um, there is going to be a wall plate over here on this side that has the satellite signal coming into it. So suggested that you put your satellite receiver here. There's a couple 110 outlets here for that as well. And the wiring is already pre-set here in this compartment where you can use um, your traveler satellite port is already wired to that compartment. Your outside um, stationary, or I shouldn't say stationary, your outside mobile dish, if you had the yard dish, that would be outside connected to it. That's the input for that here. And also we do prep every coach for the in-motion satellite. So your choice of satellite systems, there's prep up there for the in-motion. It's just depending on what the option is that you got, whether you got the traveler or the in-motion. But understand we do have the prep for all three. A yard dish, a traveler satellite mounted on the roof, or the in-motion round dome mounted on the roof as well. So kind of gives you an idea of the TV overview here and uh, what you can get, what to expect on the TV. There is a little... Um, black circle here on the cabinet and a lot of people ask us this question they see a blue light flicker that as that is the IR repeater system so um, you can close these doors here and operate the blu-ray player and the matrix 
and your satellite receiver. We have the provisions there for that as well. You can put your satellite receiver in and if you hook up the IR repeater system to the satellite receiver, just by pointing the remote at this little eye on the side, will send that signal inside the cabinet and operate those things with the cabinets closed. So uh, we get questions about that quite often. What is that little blue blink there? That is the IR system that operates the TVs inside the cabinet. Okay, so we'll move on back to our kitchen here. Talk about some of the appliances that we have. We will start at the microwave. Uh, the microwave is a convection microwave as well. So again, um, you're gonna have the rack in there. All these components are gonna come with it. We do store those in a drawer here for travel. So you will have that. It's a good idea to take a look at your instruction manual for that. We're not gonna go through the whole process of how to operate the microwave um, during the delivery video, but what you will wanna do is go through and make sure you operate it. The key thing to note about the microwave is anytime you're using it, there is a vent on the outside wall. You wanna make sure that that vent is open before you use that microwave or confection oven. That's the only venting that the microwave has. Um, if we don't have that open, we can create a little heat buildup inside there and that could in the long term create damage to the microwave. So make sure we have that exterior vent open before we use that uh, microwave. Just below that's going to be our stove top. This is an induction cooktop. Um, it, so it does require specific cookware on it. It is induction, it has to be magnetized cookware. Um, you can say different things that work. You know, there's some that say they're induction cooktop safe and they don't work. As long as it has a magnetic response to it, it will work. So with that being said, you can use cast iron on this. However, we will suggest not to do that just because of the weight and it will scratch the glass. If you drop it, that's for sure going to break this glass and you're going to need to replace that cooktop. So not a suggested source, but we do understand that that works. Um, it's best to get some of the, the good pans that have the induction cooktop uh, capability. Another thing to understand about this is, is how this works as far as how much heat we can provide at the same time. This is going to have a combination power supply of 10. So what we mean by that is we can only achieve 10 and heat wise between both burners. I can't do 10 here and 10 here. I can do five here and five here, or I can do six here and four here. It has to be an accumulated value of 10. And the reason that is, is because we are using a 110 element cooktop. Um, if we had a 220 cooktop, maybe we would be able to do 10 and 10, but for our purposes and, and our product here, we are using the 110 style burner. So, so you have combination between the two burners of 10 to get that heat. The next thing down here is our dishwasher. And the key thing about the dishwasher, again, we're not gonna go through the whole operation, but the key thing is to have the dishwasher locked at any time you're traveling. So anytime you're sitting still, you're using this, maybe you're using this for storage or you actually use it as a dishwasher. Um, we, we've had both, um, both responses really. And the one thing to remember is that we wanna have this locked anytime we travel. So I'm gonna go ahead and show you how to lock this up. There is a lock icon here and it has its own separate button for lock. Now, if we press and hold that lock button, just to hear one beep, all it does is lock out the controls so we can't change anything or touch anything. That would Maybe we got some grandkids around that like to push buttons and you just wanna lock it out so they don't accidentally start it. You could do that just by touching that lock button and it gives it one beep. But the proper way to lock this is we need to hear two beeps coming through this uh, dishwasher. So I'm gonna go ahead and press and hold it. That was one. And that was the second beep there and then you also could hear that lock in place. So now that is locked. Another thing to remember about this is this is on an inverted circuit. So if we ever lose power to the dishwasher, it, it is going to unlock itself. Now, when it powers back up, if it hasn't been too long since it's powered down, it will lock itself. It will remember the state that it's in and it will relock itself. But it has, if it's been sitting for a while, uh, maybe we had it in storage, had everything off, it will lose that memory in it and it will not lock anymore. So we wanna make sure and just verify that that is locked before we take off and depart on a trip. So that's kind of all of our components in the kitchen. Uh, we're gonna go ahead and move back into the bathroom here. This floor plan is gonna have the bathroom next. So we're gonna talk about the toilet and some of the things that are in the bathroom cabinet as well. So now that we're in the bathroom, we're gonna talk about the toilet and the toilet controls. The switch panel on the wall here is the flushing um, switches for the toilet. So small flush here and a large flush depends on the amount of water and the amount of debris that's in the toilet. So use those accordingly. And then one thing you need to know is when we go to travel, we wanna empty this bowl every time we go to travel. So to empty the bowl, just simply press both of these at the same time. So we're just gonna do this here. And that would, if I had the water pump on and everything, press both of these and let go, it's gonna empty the bowl, evacuate everything out so it's not sloshing around while we're driving. 
On this control panel, there is also a little indicator light down here at the bottom. So when this is green, that is indicating that your black tank is empty and you can use the toilet as much as possible and anytime you need to use it. Now this will go in different colors. It will be green, yellow, and then red. Once it turns yellow, it's telling you that you're probably between 50 and 60%. Maybe take caution and, and understand that we're getting full. If this turns red, it means that this is detecting that the black tank is full and it will not flush anymore. Now let's say that you have an issue where you know the tank is empty, you just dumped it, but this is continuing to stay red. Maybe we have something stuck on the inside of the tank and, and can't get it off and it's blocking that sensor from seeing that the tank is empty. There is an emergency flush on this. If you press and hold either one of these buttons for six seconds, even though the light is red, that will allow you to flush the toilet um, in that emergency situation. Now, that's gonna have a, a lockout on it as well. It'll only operate so many times until we get this light back to green. So understand that it can be flushed if the light is red on there, possibly because we have an issue with a tank sensor. So we're gonna switch to the other side of the bathroom here and show you inside the cabinet. This uh, cabinet does have a fuse panel inside and it is labeled here um, what's operating it. This has the vent fans and a few lights and things. And also there is another controller like we had in the basement that's going to be behind um, these access panels here. So access to both of these, the fuse panel, and then the controller will be behind this panel here. Another thing um, that we need to show you is of how to operate is the vent fan. So the vent fan is a bathroom is located uh, the control is located on the wall here, just to simply uh, push button control. Rather than being on our Vega touch screen, you can operate it right here from within the bathroom. All right, so as we leave this half bathroom here, I want to show you the outlet here on the floor. Um, a couple little things here. This right here is our CO detector. And then this guy right here is for your central vac system. So if we open this up and have our central vac hose, simply insert the hose here and that will automatically start the central vac. Also along with our central vac system is a dustpan. So being as we have tile floors across the entire floor here, um, the kitchen and the bedroom and things, you can simply sweep everything up and it's a little more convenient to just sweep everything up into a pile. Sweep it over here to this location and this is that um, vacuum dust pan. And simply by just turning this on, that opens that up and it would pull anything. You just sweep it right into that dust pan and it would go into our central vac system. So neat little feature that we have. There is a box down in the basement that has all the attachments for your vacuum as well. It has a hose that reaches anywhere in the coach as well as different heads and attachments for it. So make sure you utilize that central vac. As we walk back through, I'm gonna show you the pocket doors here and the proper operation. And kind of pocket door, simply just push this down. This is a double pocket door on this floor plan. So it will have two doors here that will come out and extend fully. What you wanna make sure of is that it's locked in place. That will lock in place when the handle goes up and down. To open that back up, just push down on the handle and then push the door back into the wall. And the key thing is to remember anytime we're traveling, we want the pocket doors to be in this position. The reason they need to be in this position is because there is a lock at the bottom that um, locks those pocket doors in place when you release the park brake. So as soon as you release the park brake, you may hear a clunk noise back here in the back, not to worry. That's what this is, is it's locking these pocket doors in place. So we don't want to try to move these while we're driving down the road or the park brake is released. Uh, stepping back into the bedroom, we do have bed storage and this is the access to the bed slide out motor. So just to give you a quick view of what this looks like, this is going to be your bedroom uh, ram tube assembly. And then we have access to this motor here, just like we talked downstairs. In the cargo area, you have access, just has a shear pin on it. We can pull that shear pin and then we have access to move this slide out. <clears throat> the mattress in the Aspire is going to be a standard mattress. Um, this is just going to be a, a, a mattress. It's not a, a sleep number or air mattress, so no controls to show you on the mattress, but that is just to give you a heads up on that mattress. The other thing that's in the bedroom is the ceiling fan. So to operate your ceiling fan, there's just gonna be a simple control here underneath the overhead and it has two um, different positions on it where there's a one dot and two dots. So one dot is your low speed, two dot is your high speed and then the off position is in the middle. Simply by pushing um, the one or the two that will allow the fan to come on. Now that is a 12 volt fan so it does run when you're dry camping. That's kind of the purpose of having a 12 volt fan in here um, so that you don't have to be plugged in to run that. It just runs right off the battery power. There's also a switch panel on the overhead here to control some lights. So you can control the different bedroom lights. Um, and you also have the panel light there so you can turn those backlighting off of those switch panels um, when you go to sleep. So let's go ahead and move back. Another pocket door. 
When we get into the bathroom, the rear bath area here that will have the shower, um, the toilet controls we've already talked about, and then there's the vent fan control that we have in the half bath. So all the vent fan controls will be the exact same throughout the entire coach to operate those vent fans. So as we get into the shower, we want to talk about the shower miser and how this operates and how it helps and improves the quality of your hot water. Shower miser is just a, a simple system here that puts a bypass into your shower system. So how this works is you turn your shower on. So if we were to turn this on and we were having water flow here, but maybe the water is not quite as hot as we want it to be, we can simply turn on the bypass. What this does is recirculates that water and it goes right back into your fresh water tank. This little icon right here is the indicator. So this is blue currently. When that gets warm, it'll turn gray and then eventually turn white when it gets really, really hot. That's indicating that it's up to temperature. Um, there are some, some codes and things that we have to abide by. So the water temperature, while it may not be as hot as what you want it to be, that's um, sometimes that falls under our code where we have to have that water temperature down to a certain degree. Um, so understand that when we do have this in the bypass system, like I said, it is going into the fresh water tank. So while you're hooked up on city water and you're full hookup, if you are utilizing your shower miser, understand that you are inadvertently filling the fresh water tank. That's something that you'll have to monitor and make sure we do not overflow the fresh water tank, fill it too much um, just by using the shower miser. So keep an eye out for that. Make sure you pay attention to your tank levels so that we're not getting too much water in that fresh water tank. So after we're done with the shower here, we're going to walk back into the closet area and show you the washer and dryer. There are a couple things about the washer and dryer. As we step back and open this up, we'll start with the dryer up top here. The dryer is simple. Select your time um, and your temperature, and then you can hit the play button, and that will allow us to dry. One thing important about the dryer is that we always take this out and make sure that we clean the lint trap out so that we don't have lint in there. Um, that's probably one of the number one reasons we have fires in, in residential households is because the dryer vent wasn't cleaned out. So make sure before you use this dryer that you clean that vent out for every time we use the dryer. On the washer, a couple things. Um, power, turn it on, select your source, and then your uh, dispenser here for anything that you need to put in for all of your uh, cleaning chemicals. The one thing we will tell you is that we don't want to use in here is the pods. We, we do want the high um, efficiency detergent, but we do not want to use the pods because what will happen is the pod will get stuck inside the um, screen down here. It has an, an input on the drain, a little screen on there that, that blocks and catches any debris that maybe we leave in your clothes. And normally we'll see things, and this probably applies to the guys where we leave toothpicks in our pockets or we have spare change or, or screws or something that we found on the floor or the ground. And so it will trap those there. Um, if we're using the pods, and we tend to see those pods build up in there because they don't dissolve all the way. So that's one thing that we want to make sure um, that we're using the, the high efficiency um, detergent and that we're not using the pods inside the washer. To access that screen that we were talking about to clean out, it is, it is behind this panel. So we, you will need to remove this white plastic piece here at the bottom. That'll allow you to pull this out and then you'll have access to that drain. Now the washer sits in a drain pan. So when we do pull that screen out, it is going to drain some water out of there because it does hold water internally. So not to worry, it's okay we have that drain pan in there. That drain pan is there in case something happens with the washer or we overflow or like this, we're cleaning that drain out. It will automatically go and seek its way outside. We have that drain pan that exits outside into the engine compartment and it'll just drip down onto the ground and no issues. Another thing to remember about the washer is while you're um, not using the washer, it is a best practice that we do not leave this door closed. So. The way this cabinet is set up, you do have enough room here that we can leave this door just cracked enough right here. Now, this is not the suggestion while you're driving down the road because this will rattle and bang up against the back of the door and cause issues. But if you know you're going to be there for a little while, go ahead and leave this door vented, kind of cracked open. And that's one of the purposes of having the vents on the door here. We can close these doors and not affect that washer and it has a chance to air out so we're not building any mildew or moisture inside that washing machine. So the rest of the things in the closet, we have all of our lights, our light switches as we walk in the door here. We'll control your ceiling lights in the closet. And then we'll go back into the bathroom, have some light switches on the walls there. And then we'll keep going forward into our bedroom where we're going to access the bedroom TV. Um, we're kind of doing this whole delivery in a walk all the way around the coach. Um, some of the storage areas, just closets and, and drawers and things we won't quite get into, but showing you the components and how they operate. No different than the front TVs, um, the living room TV and the exterior TV where the sound bar 
which is located down here, is the primary audio source for your TV. So in order to hear anything coming out of the TV or the Blu-ray player or anything, it's going to be coming through the sound bar below. Now there is access to the back of this TV. There's a little clipper on the back, simply lift up, and that's going to give us access to our safe. Now on the safe, it's important that you receive the master keys. And normally we have those master keys like this right here, taped to the top of the safe. You as the retail customer will want to make sure that you get these master keys because that is how you're going to set your own code, program your own entry code here into that safe. As we're moving forward and looking at the components still with the TV inside this cabinet, you are going to have your DVD player and access to hook up those things to your TV. We put a wall plate in here as well. So you can add a separate satellite receiver back here as well. And it gives you the antenna feed back here uh, pre-wired for you already. You just need to connect your satellite receiver to it and then use the output here. Now on this output, it says um, HDMI to TV. That is controlled by this little guy here. This is a one by two splitter. The Blu-ray player is already operating and running to that TV. So it is on channel one. If we wanted to install something else, even if it's a satellite receiver, a PlayStation, um, a Fire Stick, that can be simply plugged into the HDMI port here on the wall plate. And then we can turn this to channel two and that will display that on the TV. So that wraps up kind of in the bedroom here. We're gonna move back out into the living room, talk about some of the other components and things, uh, features inside the living room and kitchen area. When we get to the pantry here, we did change the style up a little bit. So we are doing all drawers in the uh, pantries now. And the thing to remember is to make sure that these are always locked and latched in the right position um, before you close this door. Cause what we don't want to do is have this just going in here and this is not completely latched. This will sit and vibrate and come out and scratch up your door, probably cause some damage. Could make that door swing open and this could swing out while you're going around the turn. So make sure we give this a good solid push. Therefore, we lock that guide into place. We want to hear that click and you'll feel that click to make sure that those guides are locked into secure place. On the refrigerator, if you have a refrigerator that has the ice maker and the front water dispenser, um, this is key to understand anytime you're going to power this coach down that you empty that ice maker out as well as in the freezer uh, because what that will do is it will uh, melt that ice and then it will drain out of this dispenser and go all the way down the front here. And that just causes some staining and some issues. We really don't want to see that happen to your coach or have a mess down here on the floor. Um, the lock, travel lock, is probably uh, one of the most important things here about the refrigerator and freezer. So we do have a travel lock in between the refrigerator doors. So anytime you're not going to be in that refrigerator, make sure we keep that locked up. Um, for sure, anytime we're driving, we want to make sure that that is in the locked position. And then also on the freezer drawer, we do have a travel lock on that as well. Again, anytime you're not using this freezer, you want to utilize that lock and make sure that we're in the locked position. This particular refrigerator freezer combo does have an ice maker in the bottom as well. So we want to make sure that if we do put this coach in storage, that we are emptying out that ice tray. Otherwise, you're going to come back to a, a, a wet mess there in the freezer. Again, anytime we're getting ready to travel, always verify and make sure that those travel locks are set in place. So another thing to check before we travel is going to be your dinette table. The dinette table is expandable, so it does extend out a little bit. And, and this one is going to go a little bit, but there is a travel lock right here on the bottom of the table. You will want to make sure that this is open. Then we can go ahead and extend the table out. Now the table will lock into place and it just gives us a little bit extra room on that table. Depending on your floor plan, this could be bigger or smaller. Um, just depending on the floor plan is how much this thing comes out. Again, before we start traveling, we want to make sure that we push this table all the way in and that we apply this travel lock and make sure that the table is locked in place so that it cannot go anywhere. So as we go forward even further here, we're going to talk about our theater seating. The theater seating is uh, 110. It is on an inverted circuit. So you need to make sure that the inverter is on before you operate the theater seats. Now, simply on the theater seat, pushing the button will allow this to fold the footrest out and recline the seat. Again, this is an inverted circuit. So we want to make sure that you have your inverter on for those to operate. And we've had that call several times that, Hey, I can't get my theater seats to work. And they had just gotten their coach out of storage and didn't have the inverter powered on or didn't have the coach plugged in that will affect those theater seats. So that kind of wraps up just walking around the coach. We're going to take a minute here and uh, get you out to the Vega touch screen. We're going to go through that Vega touch screen in detail, and then we'll move on to the dash. All right. So on our Vega touch screen here, 
we're going to go through the, the different screens and the features of the Vega Touch, starting with the home page. As you can see here on the home page, just as the different items will go over the Lightmaster. It's going to be your interior Lightmaster and then your exterior. That also has the memory on the uh, interior Lightmaster. So again, if you had just four or five lights on in here, you turn that switch off. And then come back in the coach and turn it on. It would only turn on those four or five lights that it had memorized when you turned that um, to the off position. The next thing down here is going to be the kitchen vent fan. That is the only vent fan in the coach that is still left on the Vega Touch system as well. Um, the one thing about this is we can hit the power button, we can hit the low, medium, high, we can do exhaust, we can do intake, we can run that fan up, but it will not operate or turn that fan on until we physically go over and turn up or crank up that vent lid. Um, so we need to make sure that we're doing that as well, making sure that we have that, that vent lid cranked up. The next thing down is going to be the house batteries and the chassis batteries. This is just telling us the status of our house and chassis batteries. So there are a couple things to this. This chassis battery is from that fuse that we talked about outside at the chassis battery location. Um, that is going to be the direct line to this meter here. This one here on the house side is actually post draw. So that's coming from one of our M1 components. Um, that's with all the lights and everything on. You'll see a little bit difference there. So these are not always going to match up. And you'll maybe see that that gets a little bit lower than, than uh, what we normally see. Uh, when we have the lights on just because this is post draw so that voltage is being taken from a component after the lights have taken power from that component the next icon down here is going to be your auto gen start and this is just how you enable that auto gen start now if i go ahead and touch the auto gen start here it's going to ask us are you sure you want to do that making sure that we're in the right location we're in a well, uh, well ventilated uh, space so that we're not causing any issues there so if we wanted to enable this we would go ahead and press and hold this for three seconds I'm not going to do that right at the moment, but press and hold this for three seconds and then it will come up on the screen and it will say enabled here instead of disabled. So that is your auto gen start from the home page. So down the center here, this is going to be your zones uh, for your air conditioner. This is the current temperature that you're displaying here on this screen. And then we go down and have our aqua hot controls where we can turn the aqua hot burner or the electric element on. Um, key things to know there, the, the aqua hot burner and the electric element, you'll have to have one of those features on to utilize the aqua hot in any way. The next function down is your generator start and stop. This is the manual operation of the generator as opposed to the auto. This is where you manually have to press the start button. It starts the generator and manually hit the stop button to stop the generator. This space here is going to uh, monitor the hours that are on the generator. That's a feed coming directly from the generator. This is resettable. So you can have the hour meter on the generator tracking total hours on the generator. And then you can reset this to um, give you your timing on your maintenance for the generator. So for instance, the first 50 hours, you need to have that first maintenance done um, after 50 hours, and then it's 250 after. So you could reset this to zero, and then when it gets to 250, you would know that you would need to um, service that generator again. Just one way of keeping track of the maintenance there. In this last column over here is gonna be our tank displays um, and some of the other features here. So fresh tank, gray tank, and black tank. I'm just gonna give you a percentage that's in the fresh and, and gray and black tank it's going to tell us what the levels are this is completely separate from the toilet sensors that we showed at the toilet controls so different uh, monitoring system here where we could see maybe the different tank levels uh, when this gets up to a full mark it will start to change colors on you and give you warnings that hey it's a good time we need to start looking at emptying the black tank or emptying the gray tank when that percentage gets up there the water pump switch is to simply turn the water pump on and off and then our entry door and cargo door lock and unlock. So entry door is going to be a lock and unlock and then the cargo door is an enable and disable because we have the push button on the cargo doors. Um, when we hit that disable, basically it disables you from entering that cargo door. It disables that push button from working. So think about it that way. Enable access or disable access to the door. This bottom section here is going to be our um, shore power and incoming power. Um, anytime we're on the generator or the shore power, it's going to show us here what we have coming in. And I have already reset this one to 15 amps, so I'll show you how to do that here on the next page. But this is going to give us our line 1 in and our line 2 in. When we're on 50 amp, it will give us um, the separate voltage here and also give us the amperage based on what we're using per line. Then our AC source down here, it's telling us we are on shore power. Auto gen start is set to off, and then this is just a status of the inverter. Right now, we're currently in pass-through mode because we're plugged in and our charger is charging our batteries at a bulk charge. So it's gonna give us those statuses just on the front page. So now we'll get a little bit deeper into some of those electrical settings just by going to this tab here that takes us to our electrical page. This is gonna show us um, some of the status of the entire electrical system. So 
Starting at the top corner, that is going to be our shore power. We're currently sitting at shore power at 15 amp. That's what it's detecting that we have coming in. And then again, we have the line one and line two and the amperage. This little white bar here with the arrows in it is telling us our power flow. So this is kind of a good uh, troubleshooting uh, feature where we can monitor what's happening when we're plugged in and we know we're having power from the transfer switch. You'll have the little white square there. And then from the transfer switch out to the breaker box, it's just going to continue on and show us we are going through the inverter charger and then we're applying a charge to the batteries. That's where this white line is. If we turn this inverter off, and turn the charger off, it's going to take that white line away. We still have incoming power, but we may not be charging. So this little white line is your diagnostic telling you where the power is going and how it's getting into the coach. So we have some duplicated icons here, generator start and stop, as we had on the home page, as well as the um, auto gen start. Those are also there. And then here in the center, we have our energy management system. So this is going to tell you um, the ener energy management system based on your incoming power will tell you what it can run and it will automatically shed some of those components. So for instance, we're on 15 amp uh, power right now. If we would turn on all three air conditioners, this coach would not allow you to run all three air conditioners at one time because of the lack of power. So it's going to shed some of those components. It may only allow us to one run or run one air conditioner at a time um, because we are only on 15 amp power. So here on this display is going to show us our inverter status and our charger status that it is in bulk and it is enabled. This inverter is going to be that, yes, it is enabled, but while we are plugged in, it is in pass-through. So if, if we were not plugged in here instead of pass-through, this would say enabled and inverting. And then down here, this would say enable. And maybe it, come, it may come up and say full charge or not charging. That's just indicating the status of that charger at the time. So we're going to go ahead and go into our electrical settings here just to show you the pages um, that are in this screen. Again, some things are duplicated, auto gen start settings. This is going to give you the opportunity to select how you want the generator to start based on low voltage or just on climate control. We can deselect either one of these. If we deselect it, the highlight goes away. So that means that the generator would not start automatically on its own based on the HVAC request. It would only start at this point at low voltage. Um, the other thing we have in here is our quiet time. So once we activate quiet time, it'll give you the time frame. Generally, we're seeing across the U.S. and Canada that quiet time for most campgrounds and resorts is 10 p.m. to 7 a.m. So you can set those accordingly um, depending on what you need to set them at. Now, the rest of these settings are going to all be controlled by a default um, tab on the back page, uh, which we're going to show you in a little bit of how to get there. Um, these are not the correct settings as we set it right now because these are for our testing and how we test the system and get it to operate while we're here at the factory. The other thing we're looking at down here are our settings for our inverter charger. Now this is the OEM preset. If we hit this OEM preset, it will change these settings. And I'm just going to go ahead and give you a show here of what it will do. That does change our settings to the proper setting that we need for the profiles of our batteries that we have installed. So it is showing here that our shore breaker already went back up. I'm going to go ahead and change this back down because like I said, we are connected to a uh, extension cord outside. So we want to make sure that we run that power down so we're not over doing it on that extension cord. So that gives you your electrical settings. We're going to go back to our electrical page here. Just hit the electrical tab and it'll take you back to the electrical page. We also have the solar power um, control page here. This is going to give you your statuses both on your house batteries and your engine batteries based on solar power coming into the coach. So really this is a, a display center for you. Uh, we don't, don't really need you to go into the setup. You know, obviously it's there so we can go in and change some of the settings, but it's not something that we really want the end user to have to worry about. We, we have those pre-set up for you. Um, that's already done by default settings and we have that program before it leaves the factory. So that's just in case we had to get in there for troubleshooting or anything to that nature. So we're going to go ahead and move back to the electrical page here. Um, we've covered everything on this page and the status is here for your inverter charger. Again, this is repeated information of what we have in some of these other areas, but just to give you an idea, this is the inverter charger. We will show a difference here, the 12.4 versus the 12.3. This is direct voltage from the inverter. And again, this one is going to be voltage from the load that's already on the coach. So there is going to be a, a little bit of a difference and not very much that you'll see very often, but notice that there is going to be a difference there. So we're going to go ahead and move on to our lighting page. This is going to give you all the lighting in the coach at one time in the page. Any icon that has an arrow next to it is a dimmable circuit. So just by simply pressing and holding that, and I'll just do this kitchen here just to see if we can get a reflection. Um, just by pressing and holding it does dim that light down and then it will bring it back up. So 
Anything with an arrow will allow you to dim those lights, and that's throughout. Um, any of these um, lights as well, interior and exterior, if it doesn't have that arrow next to it, it's just a constant on or off. And then up across the top, we have our light masters again. The light master is going to allow you to turn all the lights off or all the lights on, and that does have the memory. So if we only had three or four lights on and then turn that off when we come back and turn it on, there's only going to have those three or four lights that come on uh, that you had on when you turned the, the lights off. The exterior master does not have a memory to it. It's going to be on or off. And then the panel lights is for the switch panels on the wall. If we turn those switch panel lights off, those lights go off so there's no backlighting. That's kind of a convenient way people like to turn those lights off because it may give off a little bit too much glow while they're trying to sleep. So that is where you would turn those panel lights off. All right, we'll move on to our HVAC page here and look at some of the controls we have on the, on the HVAC climate control system. We do have this um, set up in zones, the front, mid, and the rear. So you'll be able to run the air conditioners. They do run in air conditioner mode. So you're getting cold air or heat pump, which is your hot air. We just run in that air conditioner backwards and then obviously the aqua hot. Um, the, auto feature, uh, the auto feature is going to allow you to select a temperature and it will use either the cool or the heat, depending on what it needs to do at the same time where you don't have to go back and adjust from cool to heat. Now that is going to default to the heat pump first. So if you're in auto mode, um, understand that it's going to run the air conditioner if it gets too hot in the coach and then it's going to run the heat pump if it gets too cold. If it does get too cold outside where the heat pump can't operate efficiently, it will auto defer and automatically select the aqua hot for you. The key to that is that we must have one of these icons here in the on position. It doesn't matter which one, but the burner or the electric needs to be in the on position so that that auto defer feature will operate should it get too cold outside. Um, so that's one of the key features of of those, these zones are pretty much going to be all the same. You'll notice that this uh, mid zone here does not have an aqua hot setting in it because that is what we refer to as the floor heat. So the floor heat in here is radiant um, heat running through the entire floor, and this is where you would set that up. So if we simply select this, turn that on. Now it does give us a warning here. As you see, I do not have either one of these selected. So I've selected an aqua hot heat source, but there is no source selected. So it has no way of generating heat at the moment until I turn one of these devices on. So if I would turn this on, you notice that that warning goes away and then we have a green light saying that we activated the aqua hot burner. That's what we wanna see one of these icons have to be on so that we can operate those features. And go ahead and turn that off, turn off our burner and let that cycle off. The bay um, heat is the basement heat that is only available in heat. We don't have any cool or anything down in the basement so that's only gonna be for heating. Um, and again, that's something to help prevent that from freezing. Just simply turn that on and then adjust your temperature accordingly. So that kind of sums up your HVAC page. Um, we're gonna go ahead and move on to our exterior page and show you some of the things on the outside. Anytime you go to this exterior page, it is going to give you this warning. Again, we wanna make sure that you understand your seats are in the right position, um, that there's nothing outside obstructing your slide outs and that there's nothing outside um, that could be interfere with any awnings or anything that we run from this next page. So hit continue, we understand uh, what's going on there. This is gonna give you an opportunity to run your slide outs and your awnings. So these are going to be press and hold on your slide outs. We will need to press and hold that while it is running. And then your awnings are going to be a one touch. So we can hit just the awning and then it'll come up with a stop button and we can uh, stop the awning in mid run if we have to. Say we notice that there's something, a tree limb or something that's in the way, we quite didn't have the clearance. You can stop that awning uh, from going out and then bring that back in safely. Um, so that's really the exterior page running your slide outs and your awnings. We'll go ahead and move on to our settings page and give you some of the features here. Um, so one of the key features for the settings page for you as a retail customer is going to be the diagnostics page. This is kind of going to be the feedback and where you will start your troubleshooting process um, should you have an issue. So we'll just go ahead and go into the diagnostics. It's going to show you all of the outputs. Now you notice that there are certain um, circuits on here. They all have a number on them and they are um, the same across the board. So when you look at the M1 device inside the cabinet, it's gonna be the exact same number circuit. And when you look at the switch um, control, it's also the same circuit. But the green indicator light is your feedback. So your feedback is telling you that that light is active at this moment. Anytime we hit one of those icons um, on the screen or maybe you're using your app or a switch panel on the wall, it should change the output of that green indicator light, whether the light is on or off, or maybe the slide out is moving or the awning is moving it will give us an indication of what's happening. And that's key for troubleshooting and feedback. This page will also give you access to 
all of the um, components that are on the devices that are on the network that gives us our configuration and our software level as well as giving us some of our faults if we had a fault here you'd have a little yellow triangle up in the corner and then it would list the fault so whatever the error is happening at that time in the coach so we're going to go ahead and go back to our settings page the other diagnostic help that's built into the screen is going to be for the aqua hot this is that screen outside that we talked about when we looked at the aqua hot there's the aqua hot reporters outside this is going to give you the exact same information that's out there so kind of keeps you from having to walk in and out uh, maybe you're on a, on a phone conversation with one of our phone techs or with an aqua hot technician and they're asking you some questions you can access that right here from the screen so just by going through and cycling through this is going to have a fault page it'll automatically tell us any faults if there's a fault present on that screen we would have an opportunity to see that here maybe share it with the technician and they may have you reset that um, just to see if that fault comes back up maybe the aqua had a fault uh, went off and now it's working again we want to see what that fault is and see if we can duplicate the issue so this is a, a key feature here um, just to detect some things on your aqua hot so we'll go back to our settings page and show you some of the other features uh, this does have a mobile app so you are able to download a mobile app this particular mobile app for this product is called the nebula mira so when you get the mobile app you'll simply have that downloaded to your phone go to the mobile app here if you uh, scan the qr code that will give you access to that and then you will have to connect to this so this app is bluetooth based you will have to be within a 30 to 40 foot range of this motorhome to operate this particular system um, through the bluetooth on this screen you will have the ability to operate everything on the screen um, while you're in that 30 to 40 foot radius so it is a, a unique way to do this uh, maybe changing some lights or things or maybe you're coming back to the coach and you want to turn some lights on before you get there once you get close in, in vicinity that 30 40 foot you can turn those lights on without actually being in the coach so just a uh, another way to operate some of the things so we'll go back to our settings page then I want to show you um, some of the default settings so this is kind of on a technician level where we would we would guide a technician through and, and we will do retail customers as well is if you press and hold this floor plan icon here it will take you into a back page and yes we understand that this is going to, going to get into some settings so please be careful as what you're doing in here but I want to show you the default settings so in here we have several default settings right here where we would want to set those AGS defaults. Like I said before, those weren't set to our default. So just a simple way of getting that back. Maybe we're not sure if it's in the default setting that it needs to be. We can go ahead and select that. And then once we hit confirm changes, it will exit out of the screen and it'll take us back to our default settings. So one more thing that we need to talk about on the settings page, and that is our switch panel info. All of the switch panels in this coach are going to be wireless. So the switch panels that are mounted to the wall are going to be just a wireless application. And they, they are showing you here that they are connected to the system. If one of them was not working, you would see that on here where maybe we have this location pinned on the floor plan, but it's not detected there, and it will say here that it is not seeing that switch panel. This is where you would select that switch panel. We can pair it again to the system so that we're operating correctly. So let's go back to our settings page. Um, on the bottom of our settings page, it does give us our software version. This is important to know anytime you're calling in for any kind of tech support revolved around this screen maybe something's not working or we got a question about how it operates we will want to have this software version um, the GUI and the logic controller version on hand ready to go as well as your serial number anytime you're reaching out for help on your Vega touch system so we're gonna uh, wrap that up on the Vega touch system we'll take a little break here and then we'll come back and show you some features of the dash as we're sitting here in the cockpit we're going to talk about the dash features and one of the last things we talk about in our delivery process um, just so that it sticks in your head the most as you're probably going to be driving the coach first so we want to make sure this is familiar to you um, and still fresh in your memory when you take off on the road so we're going to cover the driver's side console here first uh, we'll start at the back with the different switches that are on there this first switch here is going to be the tag dump switch that allows you to dump the air out of the tag axle now that doesn't lift the tag axle at all it just releases the air pressure so it it takes that down pressure off of it and that kind of helps prevent the tires from scuffing uh, when you make tight turns and again the only time you're going to need to manually use this is if you are making a tight turn maybe doing a u-turn in a parking lot or something otherwise this can be left in the auto um, feature so that it will automatically dump on its own as needed and and when it is needed to dump is primarily for uh, backing the coach up we want to take that pressure off of there so that that tire is not digging in as we're trying to back up and maneuver into a position uh, maybe at a resort or campsite next one up here is going to be the generator start and stop so that's just the manual switch 
for the generator to start and stop from the driver's seat. Um, makes it a little bit easier while you're driving down the road to start and stop that generator, maybe if you need it for the front air conditioner, um, or maybe just to get an extra charge going to the batteries, you can do that with this. The battery boost switch is going to be the next one over. That is the link between your house batteries and your engine start batteries, or the chassis batteries. This is the button that should we run into a situation where we can't get the engine to start, maybe because we have depleted chassis batteries, we can press and hold this um, switch here and that will connect both banks of batteries, the house and the chassis. So if you are plugged in, and you're charging your house batteries, that charge is then implemented into the chassis batteries to help you start the engine. Um, same thing, if you come back maybe in a situation where we had the coaching storage and the house batteries depleted, we, we forgot and left something on and we depleted those house batteries, by depressing the switch, It'll connect those batteries again. Um, if you have the engine running, that creates a situation where the alternator is going to charge the house batteries from the engine. So pressing and holding that switch will connect those two battery banks together and get you that extra charge. The next one here is going to be the dome lights. That's just for the two ceiling lights here right above the driver and passenger. That's to turn those on and off. And then kind of going forward here, the next compartment is a wireless charger. So wireless charger is designed here just for you to be able to set your cell phone here. Um, and it, it detects your cell phone magnetically and will start to charge that if you have your wireless charging um, turned on on your cell phone. So one, one thing to be cautious with with that setting here, maybe in direct sunlight, this does create a little bit of heat. So it does have a, a opportunity there that could overheat your phone and shut it off. Most phones have a safety in them where it will shut that phone off as soon as it gets too hot. So look for that. It may, it may be uh, something that comes up if you're sitting in direct sunlight or driving down the road with the sun shining right in on you on this side. Uh, maybe an opportunity to use the day shade to kind of keep some of that heat off of there. The next thing going forward is going to be the Allison transmission shifter. Uh, we want to show you a couple things here. Obviously we have our, our reverse, our neutral, and our drive. Um, so those are just the normal operation. Then we have the mode button where we can um, go into economy mode. And this is for driving on you know flat surfaces. Um, we don't really use this if we're going up any hills or anything. This is just going to be for a a wide stretch of flat surfaces where we don't need to downshift or anything and we don't need that extra power. We can put that in economy mode. Now to get into the diagnostic menu we have the up and down arrows. This is how you would shift your gears as well if you wanted to manually you know, maybe go from 6 down to 5 or something you can manually do that. But to enter into the diagnostic mode as we were talking about back in the engine it's simply press and, and release those up and down arrows at the same time. So I'm just going to go ahead and enter into that diagnostic area just by pressing those one time and it does give us a readout it's going to go through a series of diagnostics on, on the transmission. Now these are going to be more accurate than just going back and checking the dipstick. This is also going to give you more information. So it will give us our oil level. We hit it one time, it gives you your oil level. And then you hit it again, it will give you your oil life. We'll hit it a third time, it gives us a filter um, check. So uh, I'm going to tell you the status of your filters for the transmission. And then go again, it gives you the overall transmission health. Maybe we're, we're depleted in fluid or we're low or there's something going on, maybe it's getting too thin, the viscosity of that is, is weakening a little bit, it'll give you that. And then it'll go into the fault code, so it'll tell you if there's a fault code, maybe we have a light come up on the transmission um, that says, hey, we got something going on, it'll give you that code. That's something we would want to be able to hand over to Allison or to Spartan when we call them and say, we've got an issue. Um, go ahead and hit that again. It takes us to our, our uh, shifting level. This is gonna be in the um, shifter itself and that's just a status for you and then we go ahead and push it again and it takes us back to our normal operating screen where we have the status of what we're in. Um, normally in, in neutral it's going to have two ends on it. If we put it in reverse it'll just have an R there. Once you put it in drive it will have the number six there. Um, that's just indicating that it will have the six speed transmission and those are the six different gears that it'll go through so it'll display that. The next thing going over um, coming over into the dash area is the park brake. So that's just this yellow knob here. You pull out to set the park brake and push in to disengage. So you'll have to have that disengage before you try to take off anywhere. Um, the park brake is set up with several safeties as well. Anytime we release the park brake, that's what activates the pocket door locks. It activates the entry door lock as well. And then that will also um, have a safety lockout on your slide out. So anytime we have the parking brake disengaged, your slide outs will not run out, but they will run in. So your slide out's maybe not all the way in, you're getting ready to leave and you see it, you've already got that uh, park brake released. You can still um, have your partner here get up and, and run those in. The rooms will run in, they just won't run out while the park brake is released. The next switch panel um, over here in the dash is going to be your headlights. 
So there is an auto headlight feature, so you can just turn the auto on, it's just like your car. They automatically come on when it senses that it's too dark and we have that sensor sitting right on top of the dash. And then next to that is going to be your manual headlight switch where you can manually turn them on maybe during the day, um, it's raining, and you wanna have those on just for extra caution. You can turn those on, the marker lights and the headlights, so that's a, a three position switch where we go off, then marker light, and then headlight. And then the switch next to that is going to be your drive light or your fog light. That's the bottom light down on the front cap. Um, that's just going to give you a little more lighting on the ground, give you that extra clearance maybe if there's some fog or, or some haze there that we need to get some extra light there on the road. All right, so we're going to go ahead and move over here to our steering column and show you some of the features of, of the steering column. Um, we do have three pods here on the top, so we'll just go kind of in order here across the pods. This left pod right here is going to be your flashers for your headlights. That's just your courtesy flasher. That's you, know, you see the large trucks doing that. They get over in a lane in front of you or, or they're asking if they can get over. They'll flash their lights at you, um, tell you thank you or asking, hey, do I have enough room there? You can just courtesy flash them back with the headlights here and then with the marker lights on this side. So back over here is going to be your cruise control. To activate your cruise control and turn it on, we need to use a center button here. Press that center button. It will give you the icon on the digital dash. And once you have the engine running, you can press and hold the resume. And that will automatically take this up to 1,000 RPM. That's how we create the high idle. We're building extra air pressure and keeping that high idle up. That's also um, the position you want to be in. Um, should you be sitting still for a while, uh, maybe sitting at a fuel station or, or sitting at a truck stop just for a quick rest or something, and you're not going to turn the engine off. We want to make sure that we have that in high idle. That keeps the uh, uh, diesel particulate filter burnout, keeps it from getting clogged up. And... Uh, we, we don't want to run into that situation, so make sure we maintain a high idle anytime we're going to be sitting for more than five or ten minutes, um, just sitting in one position. Cruise cancel right here is going to allow you to um, deactivate whatever you had set on cruise. That also can be accomplished by hitting the brake pedal. Uh, now, the other things that are going to be on this are going to be two little tabs right here on the side of this pod, and those are going to operate separate things. So the top tab is going to be your answer and your end a call feature for Bluetooth. So when you have a phone paired to your dash radio, you can answer the call just by simply pressing the top um, toggle switch over here and then end the call push down on that toggle switch. And then the bottom switch is going to be for your engine brake. So on the engine brake, if we pull that tab towards us, it turns the engine brake on. And then if we push it away from us, it allows us to go through the different settings, low, medium, high of that engine brake. All of those will be indicated on your digital uh, dash, that graphical instrument cluster up front of the steering wheel. You'll see all those change as you're going through those modes. And again, to turn it on or off, pull it towards you to adjust um, the setting of that, you push it down. So now let's go to the center pod here for a second. When we talk about the center pod, there are several buttons here. We want to talk about just the center of this where the home button and the two arrows here, and then this back button and OK. These buttons here are going to operate the menu of your graphical instrument cluster. So you'll see in the digital dash, that graphical instrument cluster on the bottom left-hand corner, you'll see that there's several different things that you can cycle through by pushing this arrow. You'll be able to cycle through those different menu settings. Um, you're gonna have your easy steer, you're gonna have the accelerator position, you will have um, the settings page, maybe some brightness and some settings, your tire pressure monitor system, all that will be in there. Anytime we wanna go back to that home page, simply push the home button here on the center pod, and it will take you right back to your trip one with your odometer settings. Anytime we're in one of those particular menus and need to go back just one page, just hit your back arrow. And anytime you need to select something, maybe we're selecting a separate feature in there, turning something on, hit the OK, and it will allow you to select that. So the other icons that are here on this ha have to do with the radio and how it displays on the graphical instrument cluster and also adjusting the radio. So we'll start here with the screen view. The screen view is gonna change your actual screen view on the digital dash. That's gonna allow you to put up your navigation. Now this won't show our navigation. Oh well, maybe it will show our navigation. With the key on and in navigation mode, that should go to our navigation. Normally that happens when you release a park brake. Um, so this one is actually looks like it's going through a demo mode as we're talking about it. So screen view is going to give you the opportunity to see your navigation and also you can hit this again and you will get your 360 camera view, the same thing you can get on your center stack. So it's just an opportunity to have a couple different options there. Uh, maybe while you're driving down the road you have your navigation there and have your cameras there and just to keep a better view um, straight in front of you of where you're going and the surroundings of the coach. So we're going to go back and exit out of that, go back to the normal settings and then 
The other buttons here on the center pod are going to be your source. That's going to control your radio, give you the opportunity to cycle through your sources, whether it's through Sirius radio, Bluetooth, AM, FM radio. And then the arrows are going to allow you to seek and scan for those different channels. If you had memory uh, channels, the favorite saved in there, we can hit the, the uh, arrows here and it will allow you to go through those different um, pre-save settings on your radio. So the right side pod over here is going to be your wipers and your air horn. Start here at the bottom with the air horn. Simply by pushing this air horn on your graphical instrument cluster, it will show you that the air horn is active or not active. So the air horn will be active when we hit this. If we turn that off, it will only be the chassis horn and not the air horn that goes off when you um, activate the horn button here in the center of the steering wheel. For your wiper controls here, this is equipped with auto rain detecting wipers. So anytime you turn the ignition on, they are already enabled. They're in the on uh, position. So if you wanted to turn those off, maybe it's just a little mist or somebody was in front of you and uh, hit a puddle or something and just splashed something, you don't quite need that. You can turn these off, um, deactivate that auto sense, and then you can control it here by the high and low. So the high and low is exactly that, high and low speeds. The auto feature is going to be automatic where it detects the amount of, of moisture or rain on the windshield in a given amount of pixel and that determines how fast they need to run so that kind of takes over the delay feature that we've had in previous years there's no need to set the delay it will automatically um, govern that delay based on the amount of water that's uh, appearing on the windshield the center icon here is for your windshield wash and um, this is important to know if you just wanted to see these wipers work make sure you press and hold that wash button because what we don't want to do is dry wipe the wipers that is a really really large windshield and anytime we dry wipe those, those wipers without moisture on the windshield, we, we could create an issue where we're putting too much uh, power draw on that motor and cause some damage there over time. So want to make sure we always have moisture on that windshield anytime we're going to operate the wipers. The other items here on this pod are going to be the toggle switches on the side here. And on these toggle switches, you are going to have the availability to do your volume on your radio. These are strictly radio controls here. Volume up and down. And then we'll have the mute option if we pull this tab here up towards the driver that will mute the radio. And then down here at the bottom, that is going to turn that radio source on or off. So we can completely turn the radio off. Hey, we don't need to hear that. We can go ahead and turn that off. Or we can hit the mute button. And that's going to be um, these two tabs here on the steering wheel. So now that we've covered the pods on the steering wheel, um, the graphical instrument cluster and all the switches over here, I want to show you the way to adjust this steering wheel. It's going to be a little foot lever over here on the left-hand side of the steering column. It's just a little pedal you'll put your foot on. Anytime you apply pressure to that, that gives you the ability to tilt that wheel. And you also have telescoping feature in the wheel where you can push it down or pull it out towards the driver just depending on your needs. So anytime you have that pedal active, it will allow you to move that. As soon as you let go of that pedal, it locks that steering column in place. The other things on the steering column you're going to want to know about is your turn signal level over here is going to operate your turn signals. Um, we know how those work. And then your bright lights, just pull that up towards the steering wheel that turns on your bright lights. Underneath that steering um, turn signal lever, it's going to be a small silver bracket here. It kind of looks like a piece of angle. You can put your fingers underneath it. That is your four-way hazard. So anytime you're going to be parked somewhere and need to display those hazard lights, simply just pull this out. It activates your four-way hazards. And when we need to get those to turn off, simply just turn on a single turn signal. It cancels that out. And then we can go back to normal operation. So that covers the steering column and all the features of the steering wheel, everything else here. We're going to go ahead and transition over to the center console interface, the center stack of the dash, and show you some of the features, um, the cameras and the radios and things, and how this operates and, and plays a part in this entire dash. All right, so as we're talking about the center stack, we, we refer to this as the CCI, or the center console interface. Um, the key features it's going to have, obviously, is our camera system up top, and then the radio displays and some other features and functions on the bottom section here. So we're going to go um, over the camera system first here just by going to camera system, selecting on the screen, and it'll go away here pretty quick. But you have the option here to select different screen views. So we can go through and select what view we want depending on what side of the coach. You know, maybe you heard a noise over there. We want to look on that side. You can see that side of the coach and just select your different uh, screen views there. So that's the camera. Um, it's default camera source is going to be with the 360 here and then the rear view on the right hand side of the screen. Moving down into these controls here at the bottom, we're just going to go right around the, the case here. Uh, on the audio, this gives you the ability to select your source. 
You can choose from any of these uh, features here, Bluetooth, the radio, a USB stick, or your Sirius radio. Um, so if you have Sirius radio subscription, that would be where you'd access that. You would need to get that subscription and set it up so that it, um, you have this tuner programmed. The tuner is installed in the coach. You just have to get the um, numbers and call them and get that set up. The USB is for the driver's side console. There is a USB port on the driver's side console. So let's say you downloaded some music. You made a playlist, put it on a jump drive as external storage. You could upload that um, on the jump drive and just plug that jump drive in to be able to play those audio files right from the jump drive. Bluetooth is going to be your phone or a um, uh, mobile device that has Bluetooth capabilities that you can connect to it. Now this is a uh, Bluetooth communication where you're inputting a Bluetooth source to the radio. So it's not the radio talking out to that. This particular source is that the Bluetooth is being sent to the radio, um, whether it's from a MP3 player or something like that that has Bluetooth output, then you'd be able to play that through your radio speakers. Radio is going to be AM and FM. Um, and that's going to be the sources that we have available um, at this time on the radio. So if we move down to the next um, icon here is going to be a climate control. So this is only going to operate and you'll only get this screen when you have the ignition turned on. If you didn't have the ignition on right now, this would come up and say um, some features are only available in accessory or ignition mode. So just to talk about your dash HVAC system here, it is a dual zone system. So you have separate control from the driver and the passenger. Um, the passenger does have a touch screen over at their console as well that they can control these features um, from their seat without having to reach over and use the center console interface. So we can set different fan speeds and different temperatures for the driver and passenger at the same time. You see that we have different temperatures set here. And then you can set different fan speeds and we can turn the fan on temporarily here. It is going to uh, be quite noisy because the fan speed is quite uh, powerful here in the front of the coach with this new dash system. So we turn that on, let it run for a little bit, and then we're going to turn that down just to reduce some of that noise as we're shooting the video here. Um, you do have the ability to sync this as well. If we would hit the sync button here, it would take the driver settings and apply that to the passenger settings. So now they're both set on the same thing. If we unselect that, we can go down and change anything we want on the passenger versus the driver with the temperature and the blower. The modes down the center here are going to be the same for the driver and passenger. Those are not separate controlled. So if it's on defrost, it's primarily going to be controlled by the driver. And that would, uh, when you are in defrost, it is going to go to high heat and high fan. And we kind of take that sink as mandatory at that point when we go to straight defrost. So one of those things to keep in mind. Across the top here is our recirculate. That's just recirculating the air inside. And then our sink is going to tie the driver and passenger together. Max AC, again, is going to be that recirc where it takes the air conditioner, turns the compressor on as high as possible. We're using the inside air to try to get as cold as possible. And then just the AC icon here is to turn the compressor on. You can use this without the AC on. Um, that's just going to get outside air vented to the inside. If we hit the recirculate, it's just going to recirculate the air inside without turning the compressor on. So a couple different ways of, of doing that. It's really kind of basically set up just like your um, automotive, automobile, your car that you're driving. Uh, kind of the same concept here on your HVAC system. So we'll move on to our shade control. And this is going, only going to be for the driver and passenger front windshield shade on the Aspires. Um, those are the only shades in here that are powered. Now we do have it selected to the night shades. We have the night shades down right now, but the key is on. So you cannot operate the night shades at all while the key is on. The day shades you can operate while the key is on, the ignition is on or driving down the road. You can manually operate those, but you would need to press and hold that icon anytime to make sure that those are running. It's kind of a safety we have built in. We want you to be able to run those down a little bit and uh, be able to block some of that sunlight coming in, but we don't want you to be able to just touch it and go down in a zone that may uh, result in obstructing your view. So we've set that up on a constant hold power. So you have to hold that switch and you can operate those shades while the key is on to get them down to the desired level. On your control icon here, this does give us um, the mirror controls so we can operate the driver and passenger mirror that is going to control just the top portion of the mirror and that gives us the direction. Also it has the defrost. Uh, you turn the defrost on and if there's ice or anything built up on the mirrors it does have a heater in there that will turn that um, and clear that mirror for you. The memory settings are strictly just for the mirror so you can program memory set one and two maybe for you and your partner. Um, you set up different memory so that uh, maybe you get in you don't have to manually sit here and adjust you can just go to your setting and have that in the memory 
of the settings here. The pedal slide is going to be to adjust your pedals forward and backwards so that brings those pedals closer or further away from the driver. Now this is on the park brake lockout as well so if you release the park brake you will lose operation of your pedal slide and one of the reasons we do that is just safety again um, anytime you would be adjusting that pedal while you're driving you would again have to adjust your foot at the same time otherwise you're going to be applying the accelerator or brake unknowingly uh, while you're adjusting those so there's kind of a safety built in so that you can't operate those while you're driving down the road the camera icon again is going to allow you to select from cameras uh, the front the rear or the sides Again, we have that option up here as well, but this is just built in um, as a camera selector as well. So we're gonna go ahead and go to our GPS icon here. Now the GPS is controlled by what we call the Cobalt Cube. It is running off of the Bluetooth source. So up here in the top left corner, we wanna see this blue icon here, the Bluetooth icon, and this icon needs to be blue. That's telling us that it's connected, like right over here. It gives us the icon that says we are connected to that source. So this is operational and set up in the system. Um, the menu, um, access is right here when we touch these three dots here it gives us this availability here to go into some of our settings and things and then this play button backwards play is the back arrow gets us back to a previous screen so that's going to take us out to the main screen we are Sigic GPS so we can go to the Sigic GPS it brings us back up here um, to this main map screen to get into some menu and some settings press the three bars up here at the top left that will take us into your vehicle settings where you can set the length, the weight, um, the height. Maybe if you add a trailer, you can add that as well. This will give you the availability to download your maps. So we're going to go to a part of the country. Maybe we want to update some maps or that part of the country. You can go in and, uh, and update those maps as well. As far as um, going to your favorites and setting some favorites, um, you have some four or five locations that you go to. Maybe you're going from resort to resort and you have uh, constant reservations there. You can simply save those in your favorites and that would be available at that time. And then obviously our settings, that's going to be our background settings, um, kind of what we're measuring our stuff in speed, you know, whether it's kilometers or mile per hour. Um, our, our daylight savings times and our time zone settings are going to be in there. And then different uh, various settings, whether or not we have the speed limit warnings and things like that will be found in the settings tab. So I'm going to go ahead and hit this back arrow here. It should take us back out to our map. And then anytime we want to search for a location, Simply hit the search magnifying glass here. Searching for our position right now, so it may not want to take me into a search. We are sitting inside of a building, so here we go to our search. We can type in, manually type in the address, or we can search through these icons here. It will find the local locations for us, depending on where we are. We at the fuel station is going to find the closest fuel station for us. Um, so that's kind of how our GPS is set up. We're going to go ahead and hit the back arrow here and see if we can get back to the map area. So this is just showing us where we are um, on location, and that will be your main screen for your um, Sigic GPS. So now we'll transition over here to our leveling controls. Um, the coach is equipped with valid air leveling, so you're going to have multiple um, areas of here of controlling your leveling. But first we want to talk about our hydraulic jacks. That's going to be our primary source of leveling the coach. So this is going to be the exact same controller we down it had in the front fender. Um, just another way to operate it right here from the dash screen. It is indicating that our ignition is on and that our power is off. So we would need to go outside and turn that controller on to have the power accessible to the screen to be able to operate. You can manually lower or raise these jacks or you can use the auto level and the all retract. The one thing about it is to use the auto level, the key has to be in the off position. We wanna make sure that your front wheels are straight they're not leaning out into any fender that could cause damage to the fender, so make sure those wheels are straight. And then you can hit auto level, and that will level this coach with a hydraulic jack. So those jacks are gonna to drop to the ground, it's gonna dump the air out of the airbags, and then the coach is gonna seek its own level. Important about this, we do set the zero point level um, position at our factory, and we're on level ground here, and we do set that zero point level. So over time, it could get out of calibration. You may have to calibrate that um, there's steps and things in your black satchel of how to reprogram um, the zero point level. And when we are using the auto level, it is very important that you are very still in this coach. We don't want you moving around or anything because the sensitivity of that controller that's seeking zero point level is sensitive enough. It can detect your motion and it kind of throws the levelers off and gets you out of level or it goes into excessive slope where it can't actually level the coach. 
The all retract icon is used to raise all the jacks. This is when we're going to, to tear down um, camp and depart from our camp or resort. We want to have the engine running, the ignition on, and preferably at high idle so we're building air pressure before we activate the all retract. That will bring all four jacks up and then it will air the airbags up and bring the coach to ride height. So that's hydraulic leveling. Um, that's how you're going to operate the hydraulic leveling. And then we switch over to our valid air leveling. So the valid air leveling will seek auto level and it's going to run its operation here. We may get a, a slight noise here. You hear some air going in and out and we may get a beep noise from the dash depending on if we run out of air pressure or not. But it's going to auto level based on the airbags instead of using the hydraulic jacks that are stationary to the ground. So it can auto level just off of air. We can put it into manual mode. We can manually raise and lower the airbags. Now, that you don't have to worry about getting this thing out of whack where we, we're raising or lowering one corner um, too much other than the other side. Maybe getting a twist in here. It'll show you on the screen that you're getting into a twist, uh, but it's okay even if it says twist on it because what it's doing is it's automatically applying air to the opposite airbag to keep us from twisting that chassis out of range or getting it too far out of range where we could create damage to the chassis. So that is your manual mode. Then when we go to travel mode, it's going to take us right back to our standard ride height. So this is important. Um, anytime that you go to leave and maybe we, you've been on auto, you want to go ahead and hit travel so that it goes back to the standard ride height mode. Now there's three options here, high ride, normal, and low ride. Normal is going to be your actual ride height value. Anytime the coach is traveling over eight miles an hour, it will be in normal ride height. Well, let's say we get to a spot where we need to get a little bit more ground clearance and we need to raise it up just a little bit. You have the ability to do that with high ride. Press the high ride and it raises us up just a couple inches to give you some extra ground clearance there. Now, anytime you go over eight miles an hour, it will automatically return to the normal ride height value. Anytime we're getting into a situation where maybe we need to get this coach down, we're getting into a, a very low overpass or we're going into a building somewhere where that just doesn't have quite enough clearance or we're not comfortable with it, with that clearance that it has, you can hit low right and it'll drop this down um, again, just a couple inches. But the thing we have to remember about putting into low right is make sure that your wheels are straight and that you do not turn your wheels in this process. If you do turn the wheels while you're in low ride, you take a chance of damaging the front fenders. That tire may come in contact with the front fender and cause some damage um, to the coach and the fender. So we don't want to do that. Again, anytime you go over eight miles an hour, this coach is going to go back to normal ride height, just a parameter and a safety that we have set up so that you can't accidentally leave in high ride or low ride and get that, that ride height or, or the uh, ride height settings off a little bit where we're too high or too low driving down the road. So the next um, setting we're gonna talk about is your phone. And this is where you can connect your phone or a mobile device Bluetooth to your radio. This would give you the ability to have audio controls um, from, from your Bluetooth device or like we said from the steering column answer or end calls. You can automatically take calls when your phone is connected here and you get an incoming call. You can answer it from the steering wheel or you'll have the opportunity to answer it from the phone screen as well. So you have to pair your device to this just by simply hitting the setting here. To pair your device it will take you through the procedure of setting and pairing your cell phone or your mobile device to the CCI. The next option here is going to be the lights. This gives you the ability to operate the dome light um, into your light and master lights. Now that doesn't have the memory in it just quite yet. We're, we're going to have that memory in it. So over time you will get an update that shows you that memory. So we can do the light masters like we do on the Vega Touch system. The exterior light master is going to be the same thing. Turns on all the exterior lights that we have available and then turns them off. The badge lighting is going to be the Integra badge that's located on the front cap and on the rear cap. So anytime you want to display that, um, you know, we appreciate you guys doing that. It's kind of free advertisement for us. They are going to be on driving down the road, but when you're in the campground, it starts to get dark a little bit, just go ahead and turn those on. Everyone knows that you have an Integra in the campground based on that badge lighting. And then also the accent lighting as well. The accent lighting is the C's, um, kind of our staple for our logo right now is those C lights surrounding the Integra coach. So those C lights on the outside of the headlights will come on it's just another accent light there. And we've also incorporated a badge on the side of the coaches that have Integra Coach and then it has Aspire Anthem and Cornerstone, this particular one being in Aspire. That will light up as well when you activate the accent lights. The docking lights are going to be used primarily for um, getting in and out of a, a position when it's dark outside or illuminating anything around the outside of your coach. That will light up all the way around um, the sides and the rear of the coach. There are two lights on the sides on each side 
and two lights on the rear cap that will fairly bright and light up the entire surrounding of the coach. So the next icon we're going to go over is the utilities. This gives you a, a little bit of some consolidated features from the Vega Touch system. Um, we'll just start up here in the top. This is our house temperature, so this is controlling the front air conditioner. Uh, maybe you wanted to get a little more air here in the front of the coach, so you can set the temperature there that does correspond with the climate control page and puts that front zone on auto so that it can tr control your heat or your air conditioner uh, based on the temperature setting that you desire here in the cockpit area. Now in order for that to operate you will have to have the generator on so either manually turning the generator on or off or setting the auto gen start to on or off and then should that temperature change and have a request for the climate control the generator will start on its own and operate as requested by this temperature setting. The other thing that's on here is your cargo trays and your entry door that is the lock and unlock or the enable and disable for your cargo doors. Um, you can operate that directly here from your CCI screen. The last thing down here in the corner is going to be your step slide cover. So that's just the cover that's over the steps right in front of the passenger seat. Uh, while you're driving it is a good idea to have that extended so you can get in and out of there, um, rest your feet on it and you're not stepping down into the steps getting off the passenger seat is really what that is designed for and keeps you from dropping anything while you're driving down in that step well just to have that open and closed. The last icon on here is our settings page. So when we go into settings page there's a couple things we want to show you. Um, the reset of the screen is simply just this icon right here. Anytime you have something that freezes maybe the cameras have froze up or or we have an issue with the GPS where it freezes on the screen um, anything that's not working we simply just want to do a screen reset. So just by applying this right here it will reset that screen, it'll power down. Again, no different than power down on your cell phone or your computer to give it a reset as well. The other icon we want to talk about is the settings page. This will get us into some background settings. And the most important thing on this is going to be our system information. So system information is going to give us our software updates of our current CCI. Um, we're looking at the revision date here of 511. So that is an active revision software revision for us and then also being able to go to the network devices and seeing the different devices that are on this network. This will include the graphic instrument cluster and the passenger touch screen as well as the CIM. The CIM is what really is the backbone in controlling all of these devices, these digital screens and we can do updates from here on this screen. It will tell us if there's an update available for those particular devices. So I'm going to go ahead and exit out of this and we're going to go actually back to our settings page here where we have the QR code. So the QR code is going to give you access to the product information. There's going to be user guides and manuals that will show you how to operate um, different things in the CCI and it will also be where you will pick up your software updates. So anytime you have something not working or or maybe there's something that you want to know if there's an improvement to you can go ahead and scan that QR code. It will take you to a landing page for valid manufacturing of the screen. Um, they're the manufacturers of the screen and, and they house that software there anytime there's an update when you go to your settings and go to your system information and you see that you're at 511 particularly on this screen if you would go to that QR code and it has a newer version let's say 515 or 516 you would have the ability at that point to download that software onto a USB simply plug that USB into the driver side console and it will automatically update your CCI to the current software so kinda gives us a uh, overview of our CCI. We do have our contact information here so if you guys run into any issues, need anything from us, feel free to call us. This is our Integra customer service number where you'll have contact to our Integra customer service team, our tech team on the phone. Um, again, anytime you need anything from us, go ahead and give us a call and we'd be happy to help you out.